So we have uh, a few lightning talks, which are videotaped, and these are from our speakers, some of whom have participated in previous blockchain workshops, um, to give them a chance to, um, to talk to you from remotely. Um, so we're gonna start out with Don Tapscott. Um, he was our keynote speaker at Stanford back in March. Um, he is, um, uh, although he denies he's a futurist, a lot of people put him in that camp, an incredible speaker and human being. Um, and then we're gonna follow with Bruce Schneier, who many of you guys know is a, is a titan in the uh, cryptography world um, as a security te technologist. And then Elaine Shi, um, who has part, is part of the group um, of universities that received funding to do um, academic research into blockchain uh, from Cornell and University of Maryland. Um, and then last but not least, Jutta Steiner, who is uh, with Providence, uh, sorry, with Ethereum, and who has begun to build um, a supply chain um, authentic authentication platform on top of Ethereum. So, I'm gonna start with My name's Don Tapscott, and I'm sorry I can't be with you at the blockchain uh, workshops, but I would like to thank uh, Primavera for inviting me to do this uh, short little video uh, chat with you. Uh, why are you here? Why are you interested in this whole topic? of uh, digital currencies, Bitcoin, blockchain technologies. Well, let me just uh, give you my perspective, for me, what's driving me. Many people, if you flash back 20 years, were very hopeful about the, the internet and the web. We thought that it might enable us to, to have a truly peer-to-peer -peer kind of society that rather than the old media that were centralized in one way and one size fits all and, and controlled by powerful corporations or advertisers, this new media would be distributed, would be one to many, would be many to many. And as such, it would have this awesome neutrality. It would be what we wanted it to be. Well, lots of good things have happened, for sure. I mean, we have wonderful Commons created uh, products like Wikipedia and, and Linux. We have uh, opportunities now for grandparents to communicate with their grandchildren. Um, the web has changed many, many things. But overall, as Tim Berners-Lee uh, said to me recently in a conversation, this wonderful peer-to-peer -peer technology got laid on top of a society that was anything but distributed or empowering or peer to peer. And what's happened is that powerful forces have captured a lot of the internet. And they're gaining asymmetrical benefit from it. And this has created a real paradoxical situation vis-a-vis -vis technology and society. Uh, consider prosperity. We have growing wealth creation for sure, but we also have growing social inequality throughout the developing world. How can this be? We have the riches of all this data being created. Data is becoming a new asset class, pro probably more important than previous uh, assets, like even land or physical plants, um, uh, resources, perhaps even money. I mean, 20 years ago, Walter Rifkin said information about money will become more important than money you may have. But what's happened is that these powerful intermediaries have captured all this data. And they're the ones that are getting benefit from it. And there's the obvious upshot of that is that we're leaving a digital cra uh, a trail of crumbs as we go throughout life, creating these virtual images of each of us, virtual avatars. And the virtual you might know more about you than you do because you can't remember what you bought or what you said or how you read an article a year ago. So our basic right to privacy, which is the foundation of a free society, is being undermined. And, and, and people who say privacy's dead, get over it, are just ignorant. They don't understand the importance of privacy to freedom. And then we have broader issues related to freedom that are very worrisome. Rights, freedom of speech, of course, is being undermined as we move towards more of a surveillance society. And many countries have their own proprietary internet or this deep censorship. We have the rise of uh, uh, not just surveillance, but the undermining of rights in many other ways that musicians, 
for decades throughout the industrial age music industry got a tiny proportion of the value they created. The internet came along and we hoped that there would be opportunities to improve that, but it got worse because between the labels and the musicians, now we've, we've placed this huge technology industry and companies like Apple and Spotify that take a lot of the value as well. So the poor musicians, it's never been worse to be a songwriter or recording artist. So what if, rather than TCP IP, which is a great device for, or, or product, set of protocols for the communication of information, what if, rather than an information protocol, we had a value protocol? What if we could establish trusted value exchange and value creation in a truly peer-to-peer -peer way without powerful intermediaries, powerful corporations, governments, and so on in the middle? Well, you all know where I'm going with this. A platform that ensures trust without powerful forces. Call it the trust protocol, which is the, the title of my upcoming book that I've uh, completed now with uh, my son, Alex Tapscott. So, well, that to me is what's important. Now, in the book we talk about 10 huge transformations. And let me just talk about one of them to uh, get you thinking. Throughout the industrial age, we had vertically integrated corporations. They did everything from soup to nuts. Uh, Henry Ford had, within the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company, a power plant, steel mill, glass factory, shipping company, had mahogany forests in Honduras to get the wood for his cars. Well, 80 years ago, a Nobel Prize winning economist named Ronald Coase, C-O-A-S-E, wrote a deceptively simple paper. He asked this question, why do we have the firm? If Adam Smith is right, and the, and the open market's the best mechanism to determine how people and resources and capability and information and, and trust are syndicated and organized. Why isn't everybody an independent actor at every step in the way in production? And he said the answer is, and he won a Nobel Prize for saying this, the answer is transaction costs. He said the cost of search, finding all the right information, the cost of coordination of getting people to work together, the cost of contracting, if every little activity in the economy is required a contract, just in enforcing them alone would make it prohibited, and the cost of establishing trust. So we brought all this capability inside the boundaries of a corporation. Well, along comes the trust protocol and we've got a platform that radically drops these transaction costs. The costs of search. We'll see amazing capabilities emerging on how to search uh, data and information uh, on various blockchains. The cost of coordination. Well, this is about agency, and we bring people inside corporate boundaries because we have managers and agents, but what if we could have a whole set of, of uh, of business processes and of smart contracts that are, that are enabled by the blockchain that radically drop those costs. That could be interesting. And then of course the cost of contracting. Well again, blockchain enabled smart contracts that have a payment system built into them could affect those costs big time. And then of course the cost of establishing trust. Um, a, a showing that you're a, an organization that has honesty, you're considered of the interests of other parties, you abide by your commitments and you're transparent, all of those evaporate because trust is built into clever code. And, into ma and it's achieved through mass collaboration through the whole mining community. So this is beginning to and will inexorably lead to the biggest change in the deep structure and architecture of a corporation in a century. And there are all kinds of opportunities now to move towards new network models of the firm. And we talk about a lot of them in, in the new book, Micro Monetizers, moving from a sharing economy, which didn't ever really exist, uh, to a, a metering economy. New opportunities for service aggregators, aggregators opportunities to take capabilities like Airbnb and make them a distributed application where the 
the owners and renters of properties and where the people who rent properties receive and exchange all of the value rather than a $25 billion corporation in the middle. So this is a time of unprecedented opportunity and I'm so thankful that you're together coming to grips with these issues, struggling with them because you may not know it, but you're part of a nascent and emerging an embryonic governance network. Just like the internet itself is governed by a ragtag ecosystem that self-organizes, that creates standards, develops knowledge, and does advocacy and policy and, and does a watchdog kind of uh, capability. So there's an emerging governance network for the blockchain and digital currency ecosystems. So thank you. And I look forward to uh, 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 interacting with you face to face in some, some uh, location in the world as we go forward. Have a great day. Now we're going to hear from Bruce Schneier. Hey, hi. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Sorry, I can't be here in person, but I want to talk to you a bit about security and cyber currencies and Bitcoin. We know that uh, cyber currencies like Bitcoin are secured by mathematics. Cryptography protects against counterfeiting. The distributed ledger protects against double spending. And the idea is that governments are obsolete, that we just don't need them because the math protects the currency. The reality is a lot more complicated. And it turns out that governments play an important role in securing financial systems, and there are risks when you try to take them out of the process. The reason we all carry credit cards or use iPay is convenience. Not just convenience of the purchase process, but convenience when things go wrong. If your credit card is stolen and someone makes a fraudulent transaction in your name, you'll get your money back. But this doesn't happen with cash. If someone steals those pieces of paper, they've stolen the value and you have no recourse. Bitcoin is digital cash. And because cash is so easily stolen, we trust banks as safe places to store our money. But while banks are safer than holding our money under the mattress, they're still vulnerable to both bank robbers and fraud from the inside. Right? So we have deposit insurance, and we have legal rules that banks have to follow. And these protect us from thieving banks. They also protect us from theft. And a lot of these regulations are a result of bitter experience. And there's a reason why banking is so heavily regulated. And the loosening of those regulations is one of the main reasons uh, banks almost crashed the world economy in 2008. And Bitcoin has no rules. There are no rules for Bitcoin exchanges. They're technically not banks and they're unregulated. There are no minimum security standards that exchanges have to follow. There are no insurance requirements to protect customers. And more importantly, there are no license requirements that prevent a bank from acting irresponsibly with our money. And we've already seen a lot of hacks by and against exchanges. Uh, Bitcoin wallets are even worse. We've seen many attacks against wallets. We've seen lots of attacks against the computers that customers are using to store their wallets. I mean, already there's malware that wanders around automatically looking for Bitcoins to steal. The problem is that both Bitcoin exchanges and Bitcoin wallets exist on computers, exist on networks, and those are on the internet. I mean, the Bitcoin thefts are not against the Bitcoin cryptography or mathematics. It's hackers breaking into the computers and networks and swiping the Bitcoins. And because they're like cash, possession equals ownership. I think this problem is only going to get worse. Right, Willie Sutton famously said that he robbed banks because that's where the money is. The more popular Bitcoin becomes, the easier it will be to steal the coins and convert it to actual cash. 
Now, in this arms race on the internet between attacker and defender, the attackers have the advantage. We know this everywhere. So we should expect more fraudulent Bitcoin exchanges, more malicious Bitcoin wallets, and even more advanced hacking attempts against both those exchanges and those wallets. But this problem actually isn't so easily solved. Cryptography is strong, but computer and network security have all sorts of weaknesses. And without standards and regulation, it's buyer beware. And without law enforcement, the results of a mistake can be catastrophic. And the reason I use U.S. currency is because I don't need to care about the security. I don't need to care about who prevents counterfeiting. I don't need to care about how the banks are uh, arranged. I know it just works, and there's a government behind that backing it up. And the reason I use U.S. banks is because I don't have to care about their security. Right now, the problem with Bitcoin is that it requires a more knowledgeable user. So I think there's definitely a future in Bitcoin. I think there's definitely a future in blockchain and distributed ways of authenticating and for these cooperation systems that run from the ground up. But governments have a role here too. Governments have a role in society. Governments have a role in protecting us from fraud. Governments have a role in establishing minimum standards. And we need to remember that. I mean, it's easy to think of Bitcoin as the end of national specie currency, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> Silent. I would say, you know, as, as a lawyer, and many lawyers I think in the room would agree, there, there, are, there are laws that, um, that apply to Bitcoin exchanges. And, um, and actually you've seen a maturation of exchanges that want to build commercial partnerships, they want to protect their consumers. So you're seeing innovations like user-enabled audits, transparent balance sheets, um, cold storage practices. Um, you know, Pamela is working on security standards for key management to, um, to help safeguard you know, individual uses of keys. So um, evolving space and, and points well taken about role, role of government as well. Next, we have um, Elaine Shi. Hello, Hong Kong Blocks in Woodstock. And thanks a lot to Kimi Vera for inviting me to give this lightning video talk. And I'm Elaine Shi. I'm an associate professor at Cornell University. And, and I'd like to quickly introduce uh, our latest project, Talk, which provides privacy preserving smart contracts. This is joint work with my students and my colleagues at Cornell and UMB. Okay, as we all know, privacy is extremely important in financial transactions. Uh, for example, consider two companies that have an, an insurance contract in between them. And these companies may not use the entire world to learn about the, the flow of money in between them. Unfortunately, too bad if you are going to do this um, on top of today's blockchain, all the details of the transactions will be exposed directly. Okay, so can we get the uh, best of both worlds? Can we execute uh, contracts automatically on the blockchain and yet maintain the privacy of these financial transactions? Okay. Uh, the first good idea is that we can encrypt our transactions on the blockchain, but this exposes uh, new challenges because how can the miners now run smart contracts and verify these transactions uh, since now the transactions are encrypted? So it seems like these two goals are in inherently conflicting with each other, um, but fortunately, um, modern cryptography comes to the rescue, and um, there are very powerful tools in modern cryptography that can essentially allow us to achieve the best of both worlds. And here uh, is the high-level picture of one of these protocols. Uh, I won't explain the details of the protocol, but I would like to quickly point out that the main idea is that we would encrypt the transactions on the blockchain, and meanwhile, use interesting zero knowledge tools to ensure uh, the correct execution of the smart contract. All right. Um, so this is exactly what talk does. And what's really cool about talk is that uh, we don't bother the developer to come up with the crypto. We basically take care of the crypto for you. And all you have to do is write a smart contract pretty much you know, in a way that you're familiar with. And our talk compiler can take this contract and generate an existing crypto protocol that 
and store uh, the privacy of transactions on the blockchain. Okay. And we are currently working very hard to crank out the first uh, software release for Hop, and, and please check back uh, later on our website if you are interested. And before I conclude, I would like to mention this very cool initiative, uh, the initiative on uh, cyber currencies and contracts. And this is a joint effort uh, between Cornell, Cornell Tech, and, and UC Berkeley. Uh, and we are currently developing industry partners. Uh, if you are interested, uh, please do contact us. And thank you very much, and have fun uh, at the Hong Kong Blockchain Workshop. That's the great thing about problems in the space. There are lots of people that try very hard to solve them, and it helps us all evolve. Um, next up, we have Yuta Steiner. Um, she's the security auditor, right, at, at Ethereum, and also building provenance. I would like to go a bit beyond the current scope of the conference and look with you at how blockchains can not only change the way how we work and operate in smart cities, but also how they can change the world of commerce and the world way how we globally trade with each other. In that sense, I do believe that they were massive. I'd like to go a bit beyond the current scope of the conference and look with you at how blockchains can not only change the way how we work and operate in smart cities but also how they can change the world of commerce and the world way how we globally trade with each other. In that sense, I do believe that they will massively accelerate the trend we've been already seeing in recent years. They will give us the opportunity to trade even more fluidly, more directly, and more transparently with each other. Together with other decentralized technologies, they can massively improve our global network of trade, commerce, settlements and shipments. They will power smart cities, but hopefully in five minutes, you'll be convinced that the very same technology will power next level. Let's look at a few examples. Let's start with supply chain. Today, more often than not, the stories behind the consumer products that we buy remain very hidden in complex supply chains. Information about the origin and journey of the product is rarely more than marketing. And even worse, usually half masked very sad truth. There are some startups that try to respond to this increased level of consumer awareness. There's a company, a startup called Provenance, based here in London, that's trying to build a platform to create and make product stories accessible. Building kind of a product Facebook that helps you pick and the right product based on your ethical preferences. But with conventional technology, provenance also eventually just risks ending up being yet another data middleman, just like Facebook. However, with blockchains, what if we could actually verify the organic certificate that a product comes with? What if blockchains enabled like a product passport that allows us to check the identity of the coffee farmer? If child labor and slavery could not be hidden anymore in the vast garment supply chain networks of fast fashion? What if you knew exactly where the extra pound that you pay for in the shop for the tra fair trade chocolate, where this extra pound went to? Let's look at another example. You might have met Trent by now, the founder of a Sprite. Besides, he, he has um, been on a mission to fix the management of IP in particular for digital art, to eventually build an ownership layer to help if artists derive a living from their work. Being able to track assets will be the basis for more fluid, more transparent, and more fair trade. Let's look at another example. Let's look at global trade and trade finance. Over the centuries, we've been very inventive and used um, various tools like letters of credit and bank guarantees to mitigate the risks that come with dealing with um, unknown parties to enable seamless commerce and remove friction related to the lack of trust. 
A few years ago, um, Swift, an organization that many of you might know, has started building a digital platform to better manage risk and create liquidity all along the supply chain. Yet, again, with traditional technology, they risk ending up just leading to marginal improvements. On the consumer side, there are further examples. Startups like Affirm are trying to give more power to un underserved citizens like students that so far do not have the power um, to leverage the credit scoring system. Similar efforts are being made to help small and medium enterprises to leverage their good credit his history to get better settlement terms. But again, a firm's vision would hugely benefit from the power that blockchains can bring, this additional level of authenticity and transparency. Since I joined the Ethereum team last year, I've been working with various projects to explore the potential of blockchains in trade. They will lead to more liquid and open markets, reducing the barriers to entry by overcoming the hurdle of trust between organizations and individuals. Ethereum's blockchain has often been celebrated as the most advanced blockchain technology to date, but there's still much room for improvement. And while the Ethereum Foundation will continue to curate and educate the technology, I'm very excited to continue working with the core team, Gavin Wood, Vitaly Kuterin, Aaron Buchanan, Karen Kepler, to keep Ethereum smart blockchain technology at the cutting edge and to further develop and exploit new wave decentralized internet technologies. However, what will it take to realize this potential and deliver on all the promises? We need to understand better use cases for public or private, permissioned or open, bespoke or general, in order to develop the required technology. We must remember that realizing the full potential, we need a full spectrum of solutions. And the advantages from interactions between platforms running on a smart blockchain grow exponentially. Let me finish by borrowing um, from John Don. No city is an island, not even the smartest one. A smart city will multiply its benefits by being able to link to anywhere else in the world using global smart blockchains. So even though I can't make it in person, person, I hope to get in touch after this talk and after this conference so we can get into a conversation about this exciting topic. So for now, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. And um, you'll be able to uh, meet some of these speakers in person at our Sydney blockchain workshops, which is going to be December 7th to 11th in Sydney this year. And also on the issue of trust, which both Don and Bruce touched upon, Vitalik actually has written a really excellent article on, on the role the blockchains played in trust and its advantages and disadvantages over traditional financial institutions. So obviously this space is you know, moving very fast, it might be dated, but worth a read. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're done with this section? Yeah. Great, so can we just move on to uh, the next section? Uh, Primavera, if you can stay on stage, and Constance as well. I think we're doing two uh, distributed collaborative organizations. And uh, there's a hum, so we should just, uh, yep, sure, we're just grabbing a notepad. And also, could I invite on stage uh, Simon? Simon, are you here? Simon is MIA. We're ahead of schedule. Does anyone have Simon's? Oh, there, there he is. Sorry. There you are. Missed you. Okay, Simon. You're up. Oh, yeah. Are you going to do a presentation? Okay. Okay. So we get the audio sorted out. Now, this is designing and deploying blockchain based, scalable, decentralized, and community driven organizations, exploring governance systems, decision making, identity, reputation and new forms of social and economic coordination. That's huge. <laughs> and then we have a couple. So we're actually now ahead of schedule by half an hour. We built it in. Yeah, we built in the buffer. You should have told me.
Communication. Synchronization costs are expensive, right? We, we can take a break. We can make it over, but you want to take a break now? We just have lunch. Yeah, I mean, we can not. Okay, so let's just, uh, you want to take a break? No, I don't need to take a lunch. Do you guys want to break or continue? Continue, right? Hands up, continue. <laughs> Tough crowd. More. We want more. Okay, so the distributed collaborative organizations and uh, Simon, you're not presenting, right? Well, you are? Okay. Yeah. So th I will do a presentation and then we do the panel. So there's a formal presentation now and then the panel discussion. So over to Primavera. Okay. So, um, um, okay. so I will present now um, a system for, uh, so let's start at the beginning. Um, we, with, with the blockchain, we have um, the ability now to deploy those uh, smart contracts, which can eventually turn into, uh, so there's the, the concept of distributed autonomous organization. Um, most of the time, the distributed autonomous organization is actually not necessarily autonomous. Uh, it is basically just a sophisticated set of smart contracts which are interacting with each other. And um, when, so we, we can create those decentralized applications, which is basically instead of having an application running on a server, we have an application which is running on the blockchain. So there is no central uh, place. It is just executed simultaneously on the blockchain by every node. Um, so the interesting thing is then we, we now today, we have a lot of um, uh, digitally mediated organizations. So people that are organizing each other, interacting through digital media. And uh, with the blockchain, we can now have blockchain mediated organizations, which is um, yet another word for distributed autonomous corporation, distributed autonomous organization. Now it is called distributed uh, collective collaborative organizations. So uh, in the, before the blockchain world, we have a few examples of uh, collaborative organizations, which uh, are basically most of the open source software communities, uh, Wikipedia, and so on. Um, then somehow the model of uh, the open source model has inspired economic players also to experiment with um, some kind of collaborative organizations, but those are mostly like crowdsourcing organization. Uh, but they rely on one central authority, which is in charge of managing the flow of contribution and uh, coordinating individual actions. So the question then is, now that we have the blockchain, is it possible to actually create uh, decentralized organizations which do not rely on one central authority, um, that do not have a middleman, but that allows people to organize themselves through the blockchain in a decentralized manner. So uh, what are the different ways in which people can coordinate themselves? We have the, the commonplace method of uh, hierarchical structures, which is centralized coordination. And then we have ways for decentralized coordination. So the most common ones that we know is like market mechanism, social norms, and then uh, with the internet, we have this new concept of architecture. Architecture can be uh, used as a form of decentralized coordination in the sense that it's actually guiding uh, how people can interact or behave uh, on an online structure. And um, it can be done in two ways. One is a more top-down approach, which is uh, the regulation by code, which is when there is one architect or designer that uh, deploy a particular uh, technical structure and this structure will dictate what people can or cannot do. And then a more interesting design is uh, a more bottom-up approach, which is governance by design, which is basically about creating a platform on which people can then govern themselves. So it's using the technology not as uh, something that is dictating the behavior, but is like as a medium that people use um, in order to design governance system on top of this. So I will present now, so the, the question then is, of course, we need to, we need to design this, this distributed <coughs> governance system. So it's not enough to have a technology 
there needs to be a way to coordinate actions, to coordinate people together. And uh, because, we, because we didn't have such a technology before, there, was no, there has never been a need for uh, a decentralized governance structure. Um, now, if, if we do actually want to experiment on deploying decentralized organizations on the blockchain, then we need to come up with new experiments and new idea on how to do that. So this is, uh, um, Backfeed is um, a, a project, a protocol that um, I'm working with, uh, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort. And um, this is a proposition, this is a work in progress, so actually uh, I would love to have any kind of feedback on this. But it is a way for uh, uh, governing and um, for incentivizing behavior on a decentralized network, which are uh, promoting good behavior and which are distributing value to the people that are behaving in line with the value system of the organization. Uh, so it is based on um, uh, three essential components. One is token distribution, two is a reputation system, and three is an economic model. So in order to explain uh, how the model works, I will actually provide an example, which is, this is actually the first community that is experimenting with this uh, protocol. Lazus is a decentralized ride-sharing platform. So it's basically Uber on the blockchain. So I will just show a very short introduction. Mm. Is there volume? The world's okay. most transformative innovations made it easier for people to do amazing things together and meet our basic human needs. Food, water, safety, and belonging are all connected by the need for movement. Transportation is like the bloodstream of human development. Without it, everything would come to a halt. Yet along with the benefits, advances in transport have given us some serious side effects, like air pollution, global warming, urban sprawl, and habitat destruction. To address these problems, we need local innovation. Lazuz believes that pairing community wisdom with advanced technology can make it easier for people to come together and solve the challenges of transport. To test our vision, we're creating a community-owned, real-time ride-sharing service powered by revolutionary blockchain technology. Ride-sharing is the perfect platform to put our mission into practice. Even after all the positive disruptions of the past few years, our transportation infrastructure still spends a huge amount of time, energy, and effort moving empty seats from place to place. Lazuz puts tushies to the cushies, pairing passengers with drivers already on the road, and letting both reap major rewards. What kind of rewards? Cryptographic tokens with actual value and practical utility. The Zeus economy, like the Lazuz organization, is decentralized. The community decides on how Zoo's tokens should be distributed based on a fair share model in which everyone, drivers, passengers, programmers, designers, is compensated according to his or her contribution to La Zoo's. We imagine a future with thousands of Zoo's front end applications, each adapted to meet the unique needs of the community it serves. La Zoo's knows that the greatest innovation of all is cooperation. Cooperation makes it easier to do amazing things together. And that's Lazuz, unleashing human creativity to change the world of transportation and inviting everyone along for the ride. Lazuz, moving people. All right, that's, that's just a short introduction, but the, the important thing here is to understand that, um, so Lazuz has a decentralized transportation system is uh, trying to is itself trying to design um, a model of decentralized organization. So it's not uh, just about providing a service, but it's also about building the platform for this service to be provided. So they want to decentralize themselves at every level. Um, so when assuming that the platform was already built, it's it's uh, like the, then there is the question of like the token for people uh, asking for a ride and providing a ride that there is an exchange of token. But then there is also the question of how do we actually promote people to contribute to this organization. And um, in this sense, there is, uh, so the, the model that is uh, this being built, the, the, the idea is we don't want to have like, there is no roles, there is no 
employees in the in the Lazarus community. It's actually pretty much like an open source community. So just like anyone can commit code to a to an open repository, in this sense, it's not about only code, but people can commit any kind of contribution. And then the question is how to reward those contributions, how to understand what is the value provided by every single contributor in a way that uh, uh, we can then incentivize the contributions that are valuable and less so the ones that are less valuable. So the way it works is that we can identify two key actions. One is people that provide a contribution to the community, and then it's people that are evaluating authors' contribution. And out of the mixture of those two actions, we then have two outcomes. One is the distribution of tokens. So those are actually transferable economic tokens. And then the redistribution of reputation or influence within the community. So uh, as a very general overview, the way it works is that every, every contributor is providing, is submitting the contribution to the community. And then whoever is already a member of the community, where being a member of the community basically means that uh, the, the, the person has acquired reputation slash influence within that community for because of a previous uh, contribution, then those people will evaluate that contribution. Uh, whenever there is some kind of consensus within the community that the contribution is worth a particular amount of tokens, then the contributor will earn this, this amount of tokens, but will also earn a, a little share of reputation that comes along. And now, because of this, the contributor becomes an actual member of the community. And this is for the distribution of value and reputation. And at the same time, the actual evaluation process is itself affecting the reputation of the people that are part of the community or the influence. So whenever I say reputation, I actually, it's not about personal reputation. It's about how much my contribution to the community is valuable. So that is uh, influence is a better word. Uh, so whoever is actually in line with the community value, whoever is al evaluating the contribution of authors uh, in a way that is actually consistent with the overall um, ideas of the community will increase its influence within that community. Whereas the people that are actually evaluating contribution in a way that is far away from what the community thinks will actually decrease their, um, their influence. Um, now, in terms of token distribution, it's basically just that uh, uh, everyone, everyone is providing their own evaluation, and whenever the median is reached, then this means that the, the actual amount of token is distributed. Um, this is an ongoing process, so people ca can change their mind, but also people can maybe vote at a later time, so there can be a contribution that initially does not seem to be really valuable, and eventually after a few weeks or months, then people realize that this is actually really valuable and there will be a lot of people that actually provide or that evaluate it positively. And um, in terms of reputation system, the, the model is, um, um, so whoever is making an evaluation is actually putting his reputation at stake. So there is a cost for making an evaluation and this stake is then being redistributed to whoever has uh, already uh, predicted to some extent or already evaluated the contribution to be around the same range. Uh, whereas if I actually make, so if I put my reputation at stake and I say that this is worth 50, but then everyone else is actually saying that this is worth something different, then I will actually lose my, my influence. So that's, that's how there is, that, that's the mechanism that is such as to create an alignment. So the people that are actually aligned with the community value will have a high influence within the community. The people that are misaligned, they will keep losing their influence over time. Um, now, the, the interesting thing with this, so this is like the technical guts of how it works. I, I'm not going into detail, but if you're interested, we can discuss it later. Um, now, the interesting thing is then, what do we do with those tokens? So why would people contribute in order to receive uh, Lazus tokens? Uh, the, the, the reason this is, this is just magic internet money at the moment, up to the point in which we actually provide a use value to those tokens. So um, the way it works is that in order to actually use a ride, in order to get a ride on Lazus, I need to pay. The only way to actually obtain a ride, and that's the important element, is that I actually obtain a Lazus token. So this means that the people that have been contributing a lot to the Lazus community by providing code, by providing communication by whoever they decided to contribute and the evaluation has been, uh, the contribution has been evaluated positively, will have collected tokens. 
And those tokens can then be used in order to use the service for free. So whoever is a good contributor to the community can access the service freely. Now, the interesting thing is that, well, there is also some people that did not contribute to the community, but they still want to use the service. So what they can do is they need to purchase those tokens. And how they purchase this token is in two ways. One is that by purchasing the token to the people that have contributed and have accumulated more tokens than they actually needed. Or they can directly purchase them from the actual funds, from the Lazus fund. So what this means is that there is an actual, so this covers the whole life cycle of uh, the centralized organization, which means that at the beginning, when there is, no, there is no service being offered yet. So at the beginning, the people that are contributing to the community are people that believe in the, um, in the vision, that believe that this community has a potential. And what they gain, when they gain those tokens, is actually there is no real value in those tokens yet, but it's more like a share or an equity in that organization. And so those are the people that are the risk taker and which are, which are the strong believer in, in, the, in the future success of the organization. Then over time, there is the, the, the service is being built and eventually there is a point in which the, 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 the community is now providing a service. This is the point in which those tokens, which until now did not have any actual value, obtain a use value. And this is also when those tokens can now be exchanged on the market. Now, as the, as the service grows and as the demand for that, that service grows, this also means that the value of those tokens on the market is increasing, uh, which will therefore bring new people to contribute to the community because, not just because of the ideological values, but also because of the potential monetary gain that they can gain from this. And so this moves from the initial section in which it's like really hardcore risk taker to a second uh, period in which it's the people that actually want to use the service or the people that actually can see a monetary gain in providing contribution. And then there is a point in which the community reach a maturity level in which we don't need that many contributors anymore. So at this point, there will be less need for people to contribute and this means that less token will be issued. So the, the market value of the, of the token, on the other hand, there will be more demand for people to actually use the service. So this means that the market value of the tokens, of the Lazus tokens, will become really high. And at this point is when the, the Lazus community starts opening, as becomes itself some kind of like bank or fund, in which people can start purchasing tokens directly to the Lazus community. So the, the community creates an upper bound which means that whenever the market price goes over that upper bound, it will be always more convenient for people to purchase the tokens directly to the community, which means that new token will be issued by the community itself, and therefore the market price will drop. And so in this way, at, by creating an upper bound, we can reduce the volatility of the tokens, but also, this also means that the funds is, is increasing, and now the community is accumulating actual money, which becomes the money by which the people can redeem those tokens. And so we then reach the third phases in which there is this, um, this uh, partial peg mechanism. And uh, over time, the partial peg reduce because the upper, bound is, uh, is the upper bound can be lowered over time and these actually increase the lower bound. And so the market value is always within this, um, this level up, up to the point in which you might actually reach a, a total peg. And that's the point in which we, we have an actual a standard economy in which people can purchase those tokens and sell those tokens and people who contribute to the community they know for a fact that they can always redeem it for this particular amount of, uh, of money. So this is how we can move from a, a, a complete um, like economy-less uh, decentralized organization which then evolves into just a standard pegged one-to-one -one or whatever to one um, token-based economy. Um, that's about it. Questions? It's clear. Questions. Yeah, please. <laughs> any, any, any questions? Let me go. Start go oh, anyone want to go? Could you go the other way? When you're you saying starting with a token and end up with the, you know, the standard form economy, could you go the other way? Start with a standard form economy and... and uh, I mean, yeah. ideally, you, you can, but then you need funds. You're trying funds. to bootstrap. You're trying to bootstrap it's, it's this the, the idea is to bootstrap without any money. Yeah, it I is know. possible to, 
but if it's impossible to start with the peg mechanism without uh, already having okay, uh, so a way for paying the okay, yeah. so you can't start with a peg and, mm. and go back i mean if you had money through money at this problem yes as in this money or traditional money then you could might if you have a fund you can start with a peg according to the fund okay money people pay attention to that. okay so now we're going to move into the panel yeah. is that right okay thank you so can i constance simon yeah. uh, yep and we've got others joining joseph and carl oh no sam have you want to join why not? No? Okay. So we actually did a, a call for papers um, to uh, across some of the topics that we were trying to discuss here at this conference. And we received a lot of submissions. Um, they were really great ideas, but ones that needed further development. And so out of all the papers that were submitted, um, we, we selected Simon, so, um, so he's here to contribute to this panel. Um, and um, I'll, th I'll just let you guys uh, take a couple minutes to introduce yourselves, um, discuss what you're doing. Um, uh, Joe Lubin's at the end, um, founder of Consensus, and, and then we can start from there. Hi, uh, Joseph Lubin, uh, one of the co-founders of Ethereum, founder of Consensus. Um, uh, Consensus is an organization that uh, is uh, decentralized, got a lot of people around the world. Uh, a bunch of us are in New York City um, and we're building tools uh, for the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, so that's um, three of the implementations, uh, Blockchain Explorer, um, web-based IDE uh, for developers. Um, we're building decentralized applications uh, and we're doing some consulting work as well. Uh, Professor Di Filippi, I guess you know me, but uh, my research at the CNRS, uh, faculty associate at the Bachmann Center, and uh, I guess relevant for the um, panel, I'm working on the Backfield project for uh, uh, designing distributed value system for the centralized organization. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm Simon. Um, I, I worked on the, the, besides working on the IP stuff that I said earlier, um, my primary interest has always been looking at the internet and figuring out w how it changes in the way we, we organize and how we can organize in different ways into the future. Um, the paper uh, that I wrote was uh, partly um, inspired by the research that I did for my master's degree. I, I did a degree in sociology and um, I researched in the way um, the o current online tools mediate our ability to process information. So, um, you know, if you're an RC channel or you're in a forum or you are uh, in Instagram or Snapchat, how does the tool itself determine what, what and how we can communicate in, in that environment? And, you know, there are certain limitations. Some, some of them um, create a criti critical mass earlier before than bef um, uh, besides others. Like, so. RC channel can have a maximum of 200 people discussing at the same time up and then at that point it becomes chaos. Uh, it's unreadable, it's unmanageable, uh, no one can, a any new participants when they arrive just leave because it's, uh, you can't process the information fast enough, it's not novel anymore. So that's an example of the stuff I researched. Um, so looking at that I, I try to look in ways in which we could potentially how could blockchains potentially help us organize in new ways? Because, you know, the, the internet came along and suddenly we have this possibility to organize in completely uh, different ways. And one example is you are sometimes more closer to people that are in, in different places in the world than rather than the local communities you're involved in. Like, I, I feel closer to a person in my Wolf of Warcraft guild or you know, I am very close to my fans on SoundCloud. You know, that, that, that kind of community is not, not capable, but is there a way to um, create more tools to uplift these communities and make them more, uh, I wouldn't say sovereign is the right word, but empower these communities to m basically care for each other in cross-jurisdictional manners. So the paper was around um, using blockchains in a way to, to uh, mediate conversation. So if, if we, if we assume that certain tools uh, reach critical mass in terms of conversation, at some point it just becomes incredibly difficult to use or talk there, then you could essentially design some kind of uh, algorithms or, or um, uh, 
or check if it's recorded on the blockchain to check at what point it becomes uh, reaches critical mass. And because you're using a system that has a native token, a value token in it, you automatically have uh, spam control. So the original idea, or one of the core components of Bitcoin and blockchain was Adam Back's hash cache, which was the idea that you, you needed to prove something or show something to in order to uh, initiate conversation. And it's carrying that ideas around to, so that we can potentially say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we can have like a conversation tool where conversation is always novel? And that was sort of the ideas I proposed. Fantastic. So I'm just going to slow it down a little bit for this audience, um, for those who might be new to the concept of DCOs um, and distributed coordination. So you know we've heard a lot over the last couple of days about the promise of this technology to lower transaction costs, to remove intermediaries, to allow ch allow large scale coordination for people to govern themselves, and you know that was a lot of what we had heard and hoped for in the early internet days. And we've seen things with the emergence of Uber and Airbnb, um, not, um, and this idea of the sharing economy, which um, has actually, in the end, ended up serving very few um, while harnessing the power of, of many. Um, in particular, the, the, the thing that always grabs me is you know, Uber. Um, I know people who drive Uber cars. They've sold um, their businesses to buy cars, or maybe they've left the taxi industry to join this organization. And Uber has 300 Google self-driving cars on pre-order. So a lot of these guys will be out of business as they pivot. So um, just, to, just to kind of get a level set, what is really new about the things that you guys are building and the promise of blockchain technologies that will enable actual decentralized coordination? Uh, well, uh, consensus we're building a bunch of different decentralized applications at, at the application layer, obviously. Um, and they fall into essentially two categories. There's the, the straightforward component uh, where um, we're just a company and we're offering a service to people. Um, but we have five projects that are open industry platforms um, and those uh, will all have a native token. The token will be intrinsic to the operation of the platform. Um, so uh, we will define, we will stand up the infrastructure for the platform, we'll define a set of initial roles for the platform, and then people and businesses can fill those roles and ideally make a living. Uh, so one example is uh, a poker platform, another is a prediction markets platform. Uh, on the prediction markets platform, we will sell a token, uh, and we will define roughly 12 initial roles, and other people can come along and define new roles. Um, on the prediction markets platform, a role will be proposition creator, um, proposition decider, uh, data feeder, oracle, um, uh, perhaps entities that provide leverage, um, perhaps consortium coordinators. Um, so it, it's really all about um, turning the um, business to consumer model of commerce, uh, I guess opening it up uh, to be more of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, commerce layer where uh, essentially people, to use Don Tapscott's term, people and companies are prosumers, they're producers and consumers. Um, it's a, a different paradigm, I think, a more open paradigm for business. And um, so I think, uh, I completely agree. Uh, I will add also that there is like one fundamental difference, which is that in the um, in the current Uber, Airbnb, whatever model, there is actually a misalignment of interest between the people that are managing the platform, which basically wants to maximize their profits, and then the people that are using the platform, which just want to use the service, right? So when you design a decentralized organization, because you're actually eliminating the operator, you're eliminating the middleman, which has the profit-oriented uh, um, interest, then every every person that actually contributes to the uh, or that uh, use the the organization is actually a co-owner, is actually a shareholder in that organization, and so you actually create a complete alignment of interest in which the users are the, the shareholder and they all share the same interest, which is getting the best service without having to ch to wi without having to extract profit from each other because they, they all just want to share the, um, the organization together. Uh, uh, 
an interesting thing to that is, um, and I think we've all started seeing it, uh, people doing it, like sometimes when you, you've used an Airbnb apartment and you go back to the same city, some people just, instead of going through Airbnb again, you just call the person and say, can I stay there? Or Uber saying, can I just get the number? And I, instead of using Uber again, I can pay you a bit more and use the same fare. In a more collaborative model, you would be incentivized to, to, to actually go again through the platform because it creates value not just for Uber, but for more people. But uh, so I think one, one important thing is that the, the reason why until now we have those uh, middlemen is uh, twofold. One is because we actually need to coordinate uh, a disparate number of people that do not know each other and they need this kind of like central point of reference in order to meet each other and to, to match their needs, uh, which is something that can be resolved with the blockchain because we have this central uh, point of reference even though it's on a decentralized technology. So that, that's, a, that's an important thing that the blockchain provides. The other thing though that uh, requires a centralized authority is actually Airbnb is not just coordinating people, but is also providing this kind of system of uh, ensuring that everything goes right, ensuring that people are behaving properly, uh, creating these uh, reputation reviews, etc. So it's actually mm, creating trust. Right, so you have the tr this trusted identity that people can refer to, and they know that there is, there is someone policing the network. And this, this the blockchain does not provide by itself. This is not enough just to have a decentralized database in order to resolve this problem. And this is why we need to actually design distributed governance models, which will enable people, as a decentralized community, to operate and to police or to govern the network in a way that does not require necessarily a central authority. And so this is what uh, the, the backfeed model is. Uh, I mean, ter there will be many other emerging, obviously. But uh, I think now this is like, this is the new challenge. It's like, we have the technological platform. We know how to design the centralized organization, uh, but we still are on the exploratory phases in terms of the distributed governance model that will enable those distributed organization to operate uh, in a way that people can trust that this is actually everything is all right on the network. In, 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 in a blockchain model, the way the current uh, players can actually help in a way is, well, whether they'll be incentivized to help or not, it's not a question, but what they can provide in this arena is to be the reputation and trust providers. So, you know, Airbnb could, you know, open up a blockchain model and say to other providers to also be trust reputation providers. So and Airbnb will then have the advantage for being around for a while. And that's, that's a useful thing when you consider that if you have this idea that there's trust and reputation providers, cent centralized trust and reputation providers providing their, um, that, that's their service essentially is providing trust and reputation, that you could eventually then have the option where I could use my uh, Uber rating to secure an uh, Airbnb apartment. That would be great. So. Um, Intermediation is potentially an unstable thing, an unstable role. Um, uh, Ethereum, these decentralizing technologies are effectively tools for universal disintermediation. Um, and entities like Airbnb and Uber are effectively going halfway towards disintermediation. Um, in our economy, um, intermediaries represent hopefully a reduction of friction. Uh, hopefully they make uh, transactions more efficient, but as they get more powerful, they tend to try to increase frictions and uh, extract uh, more value from transactions than they add to value. Uh, so in these decentralized platforms, we have a mechanism for essentially price discovery uh, for the appropriate um, price or cost of intermediation. Intermediation is a great thing. Let's just pay the right price for it. Right. Um, actually, I'm, I, I'd love to hear from you, Joe, about um, the, the, the new emerging governance models that are actually um, uh, being developed in practice on consensus. I think one of the reasons why people are so excited about consensus is that it's identifying actual use cases and building them out. Um, hopefully, you know, making tangible the promise of blockchain and the Ethereum platform. How are you seeing these kind of emerging um, governance models? Within, within consensus? I know it's a rather large team. Uh, it, it is a large team. Um, so 
at the platform level, just one one form of it, it's almost like uh, um, some of these platforms are self-governing. Um, so another platform that we're building is essentially a resource-driven platform. Uh, it's an open energy market platform, uh, and effectively uh, in the energy industry. Um, the physical infrastructure for electricity delivery is becoming decentralized. Um, and there isn't really a business logic uh, infrastructure above that that exists yet. Um, and so the Ethereum technology and some of the tools that we're building uh, is kind of perfect for that. Uh, and essentially, in those kinds of niches, um, a generator of electricity is, is um, creating a resource or has the potential to create a resource in the future, and you can uh, create a token and issue that token, a kilowatt hour token, um, and you can either have people trade that token on a spot market for either stored resource or immediately generated resource, uh, stored in batteries, obviously, or you can issue um, uh, futures or options against your, your future capability to deliver that. Um, these kinds of infrastructures may require uh, governance. I think it'll be governance of all the people that um, own the tokens. They're all stakeholders in the system. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how governance emerges. Mm -hmm. um, I th uh, so much of, of this is about technological governance. And you know, I'm, I'm reminded again and again that these are tools that are, that are wheel and designed and wielded by, by human beings at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, one thing that, that I've, I've seen is um, in the space is that there are a lot of communities around the world that are outside of these formal coordination trust systems um, that actually work really well. They're incredibly resilient communities that pass money, that share goods, um, but these are communities that can't scale beyond the village, beyond the, the, their, their little local community, and the promise of blockchain is that, you know, one day they might. Um, and then what you've seen, though, is, is as, as communities grow larger and you don't have that face-to-face -face contact, um, a lot of the um, kind of the values, community values that are embedded in these local systems can't be replicated. So what I'm wondering is, is with reputation systems in particular, um, how are we to avoid kind of the peril of, of kind of herd mentality? How are we to actually establish, you know, real trust? How, I mean, for example, could there be a civil attack on reputation? Um, could you create fake reputations? Could you get rid of a reputation that was not, not earned, for example? Um, how, you know, in, in kind of matching trust and face-to-face, -face, um, uh, you know, knowledge of each other, can, how can we match that in, in the kinds of reputation systems that we're building? So I, I can take that. Um, so in the real world, it's hard to, to uh, conduct a, a civil attack because our reputations are multifaceted. Um, so we're building uh, a wallet, uh, the wallet holds tokens of value and other things, um, but it also serves as a container for anchors for identity and persona. Um, pers uh, an individual could have multiple personas that they uh, repre represent, represent themselves from and interact in the world from. Um, you can have a canonical persona that represents your state registered identity. Um, and you can have business persona, gamer persona, perhaps a dark persona that you don't want linkable to any of your other personas. And persona is also a container for reputation. So we built a reputation system um, that enables uh, counterparties um, to attest to um, the conduct of other counterparties in transactions like purchase and sale and lending, um, borrowing, repayment, um, gaming, uh, collaboration amongst a group of people towards a specific goal, like uh, uh, creating a piece of software. Um, and our thesis is that uh, if you have multifaceted aspects of reputation, um, and it's richly connected, um, so there aren't little islands where um, there's this whole group of personas that are all positively feeding back on one another, um, but you have a persona that's richly connected to multiple personas uh, in various different dimensions, that that will be very difficult to spoof. Um, I, I think also, also as well, uh, 
being in the blockchain space, I think a lot of us is very idealistic and like try to think of very grand about how we can really change the world. And I think being like tr trying to be more pr pragmatic about it, the these kind of systems just need just needs to be a bit better than the previous ones. It doesn't need to be like overhaul the whole system and like suddenly we have whole new reputation systems. It just needs to be better. So just a, like a basic idea of the fact that why can't you like borrow reputation from other services? It's not, it's like, I mean, there are, s there are reputation aggregators, like, you know, cloud or something like that. But, you know, that's, that's something that makes sense to us, just the fact that, you know, wouldn't it be great if you can do that? But online services don't really provide that interlinking yet. So just by the fact that we, we're just thinking like, what's the next step and that next iterative improvement? And uh, also I think that it depends on which community we're talking about. Um, I think there are some communities that will require some level of identity. Um, and then we can have like decentralized identity management system which have different layers and you can connect your persona and this close only a part of your persona according to wh who you're interacting with. But, and this is challenging actually, but uh, we are, we this is the same thing we're exploring how to do this. Uh, there are quite some initiatives that are doing that. Um, there is an interesting initiative that is Treaty, uh, which is uh, reputation management, and uh, which are also now uh, going towards like certification, so insurance. So you collect, it's kind of like the, the one name system, you, you collect multiple uh, identities into one, you collect multiple reputation, and you aggregate everything, and then you can act as a, you ensure that this person is trustworthy because the more the more aggregated um, information you have, the more trustworthy you can be. Uh, but I think that there is also other communities that in fact you don't need an identity as such, as much as you need a way to interact with that community. And I think in, like for instance, in, a, in an open source community or in, in even in, in things like Lazus, it's not really about who I am as much as about what did I do in the past or like what is, what is my contribution to this community? And in this sense, it's actually, it, it to some extent, I don't know what is easier or not, but you can actually design system in which it just doesn't matter. So it's not about, it's not about uh, like trying to identify how I can know that this person is this person. It's actually whether I am one person, whether I am splitting my identity into 100 different uh, personas, or actually whether I'm aggregating myself into a group I will have exactly the same effect when I'm interacting with the system. And in that sense, you're actually bypassing the problem of identity management by just relying on reputation slash influence, which can be easier for certain communities, probably doesn't apply in the case of, for instance, a bank and things like this in which you actually need an identity. But for many communities that do not require an identity management, I think it can be actually much easier. And perhaps you could interact with a system that requires a person to connect for, for KYC. And so you, you can also start thinking about reputation in a more economic context. Um, there's a system called Trust Davis that uh, we're just starting to look into implementing. And uh, it's essentially uh, a vouching system. Um, so I can vouch for Simon in a financial transaction. I know he's good to repay that loan, or I believe he's good to repay that loan, um, and the lender can just trust me um, to vouch for him, or I can put some money behind Simon uh, and say I will guarantee all of that loan or a portion of that loan. Uh, I may do that just because I'm a nice guy and Simon's my friend, or I may do that um, as, uh, as a piece of business. I may take a small cut from that. Uh, so the the blurring of reputation and business is interesting. Um, another really interesting aspect of reputation in this context is that uh, essentially digital ID um, and reputation becomes portable. Uh, so I can go into a, a bank office and probably put some aspects of my reputation on on the table uh, and get a loan, but most people around the world can't do that. But if they do develop an online persistent portable reputation, um, they can access capital pools from all around the world and, and maybe get a small loan and build that reputation. So um, uh, one of the, the most exciting, I think, 
uh, potential of, of these technologies is the ability to um, tokenize or represent um, different forms of value. So, you know, we started with the first blockchain was Bitcoin um, and this idea, and you had to get really philosophical about what money is, you know, what, what really is it, a medium exchange, store of value. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, it's, it's some representation of, of your blood, sweat, and tears, either your usefulness, your labor, um, something. Um, um, what I'm wondering is, um, just like um, access to networks, um, you know, in the real world, that would be your social network, your family network, your financial history, um, that, that people are able to build that up over time, the stronger the network is. Um, if we tokenize something like reputation, do you think you would see the same kinds of um, kind of concentrations of people who had access to those networks? Or do you think it would allow, you know, for example, if you could have a portable um, identity which you could um, uh, capitalize on online, um, would that equalize um, the ability to build capital, whatever form of capital that took? And then my next question, um, which maybe you guys can answer together, is, you know, um, so th this is an exciting potential to be able to really have a token that represents a community value, um, something that, that you really value, your ethics, um, you know, to be able to demonstrate and count things like helping others, things like creating art, things that are actually creating real value in the world that aren't counted right now by traditional economic measures. Um, but then there's also the danger of making every interaction um, an economic interaction. Um, so that I think that goes to the last point. Um, will we help each other because we think we will only be rewarded? Will that change kind of the social psychology of how we give? Um, so would love would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, um, the the idea of using tokens to like create more capital and and share wealth it's an ex it's a really exciting idea, um, just because of the fact that when we look at the current ways in which we create wealth, it often excludes a large portion of the population. Um, you know, it's it's you know, if you are someone that is poor and they they really believe in this company and and they want to partake and, and buy some shares, e even just getting access to or know how to buy a share in a public market, that that education is there. That person doesn't have the money. Um, it's difficult for them to to start uh, small businesses, for example. But but even on a more granular granular level, it's like, you know, what if this guy in this community is a rapper, right? And like he, he feels he's gonna make it big. You know, it's like there there is this sort of value that circulates in this in this in these networks, but it's not being unlocked in any way. And and just the idea that potentially we could create more opportunities for wealth sharing, that's that's exciting. And and onto the next point which is does this create an issue in terms of valuing interactions? It 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 is potentially an issue because of the fact there, there's been a lot of scientists and a lot of studies in this regard. One, one of the famous examples is by um, uh, a scientist called Dan Ar Ariely. Um, he wrote a book called Predictably Irrational. And he gave an example of if you, if you want someone to help you move your furniture, uh, if you tell them, hey man, uh, next weekend I just need some help, I'll give you some beers afterwards, People are more than willing to help you because it's a it, the, the interaction is not an economic interaction; it's a social interaction. But if you tell them, "Hey, man, like, I have ten dollars to give you," they're gonna go like, "What is that? The, are, is that what I'm worth? Is this what this thing is doing?" So, it is a difficult thing to to say. Yes, we want to create more wealth sharing opportunities, but it's a problem if that starts changing our interactions with people. So, ideally, we would want a combination of both, which is unlocking networks of value, but putting it and letting it disappear behind interactions. So that it still feels like a social interaction, but we're still helping each other and hopefully unlocking more value. Um, on that point, I will also suggest everyone. So uh, as I was working on Backfield, I think over 50 people told me that I need to read uh, Down, In and Out in the Magic Kingdom of Cory Doctor which I did read, by the way. And it's actually a really good book. Um, it's really short. And um, it's, it's actually about how society will become. So it's in an abundant society in which like, people don't have like problem with scarcity and that there is no more money, but there is reputation. And so every, every interaction becomes monetized. I mean, 
the, the money becomes the reputation. And uh, it's kind of like this dystopian vision of society in which everyone is like really afraid of interacting with anyone else because they know they're gonna be judged all the time, etc. Which is probably not a society in which we want to live in. Um, however, I think that, uh, and I think this is, this is an important thing to, to keep in mind when we actually move into all those reputation systems. I mean, like, reputation is the new currency, perhaps, but um, I think there is like two things. One thing is like reputation should actually not be transferable because otherwise tr the reputation is currency. And the other thing is that, and this is something really important like for the backfield model, but I think in general, um, reputation, like reputation to the person is different from reputation according to uh, the contribution. So if what you're evaluating is the human relationship, because when I interact with someone, I'm getting evaluated all the time, that's not really great. On the other hand, evaluating a particular contribution of a person does not really does not really say anything about the person as much as how much that particular contribution is valuable in the eyes of a particular uh, subjective value system, which is a community value system. And in this sense, you can actually like, in this sense, I don't think it really distorts too much. Um, the, like, I don't think it gets into such a dystopian society. On the contrary, actually, because in I can I can make contributions and I can actually see where my contribution is the most uh, appreciated, and therefore I can understand which community are aligned, and uh, which community I should actually be contributing to because those are the ones that uh, actually appreciate my contribution. So I think reputation is a kind of this tricky word because it means many different things and it can it can be applied to many different things. But I think when we actually, like in, a, in the context of decentralized organization, uh, identity management is one particular kind of reputation, whereas like value distribution and contribution based reputation is really different. And uh, it I think it's less dangerous. <laughs> okay, so one in one approach or, or um philosophy would be that uh, all interactions are economic interactions. Um, and so uh, we can have monetary interactions, we can have emotional interactions, social interactions, psychological interactions, and, and one could argue that we're always um, uh, putting a price on them or putting value to them. Uh, and so if we do explicitly represent those things uh, with tokens on a blockchain, and I'm, I don't have systems <laughs> for all of those things, of course, um, then it, it'll be interesting to see how uh, all of those values are determined in perhaps open markets. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether we deceive ourselves less about our own value. Um, yes, it's a, it's a brave new world. Um, so, uh, just on, on, on that point of that you can select your community too that, that uh, reflects your values. In, um, in these models, do you see this as a two-way street that, you know, yes, your reputation will be public, um, perhaps, maybe perhaps not fungible, but, um, but carries some sort of economic value, um, but will we then also see um, kind of the, the content of the communities that coalesce? Is it, is it a two-way mirror? So in our model, uh, repu reputa or persona is essentially the container for reputation. There are two kinds of reputation. There's reputational attributes. Um, and those are things that you own, uh, state registered ID, Twitter, email, et cetera, medical records, financial records. These are things that you want to be potentially private and granularly under your control. And those things, you, you let your eye doctor see some things. and and your banker see other things. Um, and uh, attestations, reputational attestations that I was talking about before, those things are not really under your control. So those, those are out in the community. Um, and Like a Yelp rating. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so uh, I can perhaps um, say that I disagree with this attestation, but I can't erase it. backfeed model um, would there also be the ability to you said that um, you know you can you can then see you can then turn to communities that reflect you know um, certain kinds of values the more these reputation systems become more robust um, 
how do you see that kind of flow of information and reputation building between communities and individuals? Well, so actually, one of the main uh, justification why uh, I started working on the Backfield project was actually that uh, the recognition that oftentimes you contribute to different communities, and it's actually there is um, there is kind of like a high cost of uh, switching from one community to the other because there is no interoperability. Um, in fact, uh, so by analogy with the internet, I will say that um, we're now, um, uh, like the way I see the Backfit protocol is actually like some kind of, just like the HTTP protocol. So in the sense that we are, like with the blockchain, we are now developing a lot of application, centralized applications, which do not have any way of uh, interoperability between each other. In, in the same way as like um, before the web, before the HTTP, people were just building applications on top of the TCP IP, but uh, those applications were just like starting from scratch and uh, did not have a common protocol to communicate with each other. So in some way, it's, it's not a perfect analogy, but the idea is that by, by deploying this, uh, this protocol layer on top of the blockchain, then you can use this protocol to create a particular decentralized application. You can use the same protocol for another decentralized application. And because they have a common basis, they have a common understanding of like a token and reputation, then they can interact with each other. So as I acquire influence within one organization and I have influence in another organization, if that organization itself can be regarded as like kind of a concentric model within a larger ecosystem, this organization itself has influence within the ecosystem as well as the other one. And so by transitivity, I can understand what is the value of my reputation in one organization and in the other and more globally within the ecosystem. So by, by using similar protocols, then we can then create much more interoperability between different value system, which we, we, don't, we don't need to understand or we don't need to explicitize what are the different value system of those organizations. But because they all belong to the same ecosystem, we can understand what is the interaction between them. And so me contributing to one organization, I accumulate both tokens from that organization and reputation from that organization. And um, so this allow me two things. One thing is that I can, I can understand, uh, so let's say I contribute to Wikipedia and then Wikipedia itself has some kind of reputation within the broader uh, Creative Commons community, right? So me contributing to Wikipedia means that my reputation can also be understood within the Creative Commons community because there is this common protocol. Uh, the other thing that is also interesting is at the token level. So I will like, we, because now communities can create their own token, which is the, 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 whole, the whole innovation in some way of the blockchain. Uh, those those tokens have a use value within the community, right? Those tokens do not necessarily have any economic value like on the fiat market. But if, 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 I, if I have tokens for one community and then another community has its own token, like every community actually has their own value system and token system, then as long as the people from this community also have an, uh, a desire to use the service from another community, then they will be willing to transact those tokens. And so you can actually create like, and the more there are, like the, the more communities are using the same protocol with similar um, mechanism for distributing tokens, then you, you can actually get a much more like a rich network, like a mesh of uh, possible exchanges to an extent in which we actually get to the model in which every community creates its own token and according to how the, what is the systemic value of every community within the overall ecosystem, that is the value of that token. And, th and I can just exchange it with whoever wants the service from that community. Very exciting to think of um, communities as markets to actually kind of promote connection versus competition. Um, although I don't want to know what the exchange rate would be between all of these communities. So before I open it up to the audience, um, just one last question. I actually really hate being asked this question on panel, so I apologize in advance. Um, but I would love, I would love to be a part of a decentralized social network. I would love to be able to connect 
without sacrificing everything that I'm creating to, the, to, to a corporation. Um, I would love for the things that I do that don't bring me currency um, to, to be something that I can uh, survive and, and live, prosper, you know, live in prosperity on. Um, how far are we? How far are we from, from actually having some working systems where some of these things might exist? You know, one year, five years, 20 years? Well, uh, de a decentralized social network, I mean, internally we, we had uh, uh, one of the developers at a hackathon made a, a, a Twitter equivalent on Ethereum. I mean, it's, it's, it's possible. So, I mean, it can exist. I think the better question is, why should it exist? And in this example, you know, one, you know, people have started complaining about Twitter based on the fact that people can, uh, politicians were removing things they said in the past, right? Um, Have so you read Twitter's terms and services, terms and condition? It's not nice. Yeah. They own a lot um, of stuff. So in that example, you know, you could, s you could say to politicians, well, you know, you better use the blockchain version because we want to hold you accountable. So like things you said should remain open and, and public. Um, but in general, you know, uh, a blockchain-based social network will need to be much different than whatever exists today. Um, the incremental innovation would probably not be sufficient for people to uh, jump ship, right? Because like we, we, are, we are people that are currently more on the fringe. Like we appreciate privacy or like control and et cetera, et cetera, right? So, uh, but the core functionality of a social network is still the fact that it's about connections. Uh, and you know, Facebook and all Instagram, all these things have incredible network effects. And for 95% of people, that's fine. Until more people start caring about the things we care about, or we invent something completely new which induces new exciting connections, like you know, uh, community companies, uh, cross-jurisdictional community companies will need people who want to engage in that field and area. They want to communicate there because it builds up reputation or it makes them tokens. So that, that's my view. Um, I think there is like many wa many ways in which it can be implemented, uh, and there is two reasons why you would want to. So one, I would say there is like Twister, which is actually like really old, and I don't think anyone has ever used it. I tried to install it, but it was really difficult, so I gave up. But the the concept of Twister was let's use like the blockchain and we'll let's have like um, no middleman, no censorship, etc which is great, but it's not enough. And essentially people don't care, like diaspora has, has shown it, like decentralization, decentralization and freedom of expression is not enough to justify people to actually move into a decentralized system. On the other hand, I think, and the blockchain actually provides more than that. And I think what the blockchain, like the, the, um, the power of the blockchain is that it actually enable things that are not easily implementable without, which, uh, uh, so I, I will, I mean, there is an actual amazing social network, which is Scenario, which is a beautiful, a really beautiful protocol. Um, and what it does, it actually uses the blockchain for what the blockchain is good at, which is uh, controversially the monetization of social communication. Um, so the way it works, in a, like the, the protocol is really beautiful, but in, in a very summarized way is that basically you pay in order to express yourself. If people actually appreciate what you're tweeting, they gonna, <laughs> um, then you don't pay because this means that people actually enjoyed receiving your communication and then the more you're retweeted, the more actually you earn money. On the other hand, if actually, you, you so you can choose about how much, how much far away your voice can go you pay according to broadcasting the further. If people actually do not retweet you, it means that you're actually spamming them, that you are providing information that is not valuable to the network, and therefore you just pay. So you're actually using the monetization, which is, which is what the blockchain is good at, right? So I'm not saying that scenario model is like amazing in the sense of like the way in which it monetizes, but it understands that what the blockchain provides in a beyond the decentralization, beyond, beyond the ability and the sense of resistance, is the ability of designing like monetary or like economic games 
which can improve the system. So the problem with Twitter today is that I just see a lot of stuff that mostly, oftentimes, I don't really care about. If you can actually design a system, whether it's with reputation, with influence, or with economic uh, uh, transactions, which al enable me that when I connect to Twitter, I actually see what I want to see, because I see things from people from my community, or because I see things that people from my network have decided to retweet because they thought it was valuable, then it becomes much more interesting. And so I think the, the I mean, so scenario exists, I think there will be many others that arrive, but uh, the there is a very important reason to use the blockchain for, for those things. Then the question is whether it's, um, it's nice or not to monetize social communications, but that's a different issue. Um, so we're working on two projects that might be interesting answers to your question. Um, first one is a decentralized Reddit system. Um, and so that basically looks um, at the foundation, very similar to a Reddit system, but uh, uh, we have the notion of gilding a post. Uh, and essentially, if you, you or other uh, people on the system want to uh, send some ether uh, to that post, uh, that post can become gilded, essentially, and memorialized forever. It can be one post or um, a whole thread or a, a set of posts. Um, and you might want to do that if it's something particularly brilliant uh, or if, if it's something you don't want to be censored by, uh, by a centralized version. So, so the main foundational part uh, will either be based on uh, Ethereum's Whisper or it will be centralized. Probably initially it'll be centralized, but eventually decentralized. Um, the other project is something called Uport. Um, and we're, we're starting to think that the wallet is the new browser. So you're going to be interacting in, in this decentralized space um, from your identity and persona, which are anchored in keys uh, in your wallet. Um, and um, if you think of, say, publishing systems all the way to advertising systems, you can interact with those systems from one of your personas. Um, and you can subscribe to a publishing system and pay some money to receive some content that you're interested in reading or interacting with. Um, you can receive some money um, for seeing an ad or interacting with some with an ad or, or doing a little piece of work. Um, and right in the middle, uh, if you're not interested in paying for this content and you don't need to be paid for this content, like it, maybe it's pictures of my friends at a nightclub the night before, so that, that's basically a news feed. Um, and I can subscribe to that news feed, and that news feed can be coded to me privately or coded to a group um, so that only the group sees it or, or just public. And that's, that's a decentralized, uh, configurably private Facebook. Pretty awesome stuff. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, Robin? So if you're familiar with the uh, tale of stone soup, yes. a lot of this sounds like the stone in the stone soup. Uh, that is, blockchain doesn't seem to be very central to most of these stories. There's a wide space of institutions that could be designed and explored, and most of these things you're talking about seem interesting, exciting, if, if risky and unlikely, but, but blockchain doesn't seem to be very needed. So could you elaborate, just emphasize where it is that blockchain ends up making a difference here? Um, so blockchain makes a difference in, in that it is a community network uh, where we all um, recognize each other's public keys and we store our own private keys and a lot of the stored data can be shared on the blockchain and a lot of the stored or a lot of the computation at least on the ethereum uh, system uh, can be shared and we can all agree on exactly what happened and when it happened I think for for me there thinking about it now, but that there's, there's some usefulness. Um, the one is um, that any interaction, if you're working with a public blockchain, has you require a native token, right, which has value. So it, it adds new emergent features to interactions that wasn't possible before. Like not, if you click like on Facebook, you're not putting in a credit card each time, right? So it's, it, that, that provides potential new emergent factors. The second one is that um, it's a more interoperable ecosystem. 
uh, between different applications. And this it's more easily portable between different uh, parts of it. Um, assuming you're, say, using Ethereum for all, all these applications. Um, if you now want to you know, tell Airbnb, I want to use your reputation system for my sharing economy application, you, that's probably not gonna happen. They, they'll have to build an API probably, and then they'll have to test it for a few months, and, and they might not ev ever do it. So that the fact that it's sort of a more open access layer helps in that regard. Al also, non-repeatability is an important property. Um, any centralized system can be manipulated by the people in control of it. And uh, also, I mean, the main thing I think I will say is that there is no middleman. And this has two implications. One is that I don't need to trust one central authority to behave well. So currently I have to trust Twitter, I have to trust Facebook that they will actually act. Of course you can implement the same model on a centralized model, but then I need to trust that the central operator will actually behave accordingly. Um, but the other one, which maybe is just as interesting, is um, to the extent that there is this tokenization. So when we actually create for like the example of Lazus, for instance, because we are tokenizing those interaction, the, um, and because we are eliminating the middleman, it means that everyone that is contributing to the community and that holds those tokens, then they have an incentive for this service to be the best possible service because this will actually increase the value of the tokens. So because everyone is a shareholder in the organization, we all want this organization to be the best organization ever. So we all, we, we all have the exact same aligned interest within the organization. Yeah, I mentioned it before, but uh, censorship resistant systems I think are extremely valuable and I don't know how to do that in centralized systems. Okay, uh, Rick? Yeah, a question. <laughs> Regarding the products you've been talking about, you've been using terms like shares, markets. A lot of the terminology sounds like the type of things that would be regulated. Have the folks at Ethereum, have you guys been looking at whether any of the new systems or ideas that you're coming up with are going to be subject to regulation in the United States or in Hong Kong or other places? Um, so for, I, I don't, um, some of you may not know that Ethereum was funded uh, through a sale of software. Um, that software uh, was classified as such as a software product in Switzerland uh, where Ethereum uh, is located or where the foundation is located. Um, and uh, we worked with Swiss lawyers, we worked with uh, US lawyers and um, it became clear that there was an interpretation that uh, the token that we sold, uh, the Ether token, similar to the Bitcoin token, was uh, intrinsically necessary for the proper operation of this global computing appliance. Um, and so we uh, believed very strongly that we were not selling a security. Um, and uh, um, according to our lawyers, we pass, or we don't pass uh, the Howey test, or uh, we uh, uh, are clean in that regard. Um, so uh, we at Consensus, uh, as we stand up these platforms, uh, we will do similar work with lawyers and uh, uh, make sure that we're not outside the bounds of securities law, uh, both in the US and in other places. Um, uh, it looks like a lot of these systems will um, be structured similarly. There are a, a lot more difficult ways to create tokens without requiring a centralized issuer. Um, Bitcoin is an example using proof of work. Um, y uh, there are some tools that have been developed um, um, on Ethereum where you, we, you could create tokens, um, but it, it's a process of verification that then the program, it, the contract itself issues the tokens. So it's not people uh, somewhere in the chain that issues the tokens, but it's a completely gray area at the moment, the fact that uh, code the code is issuing the tokens. I mean, is are we going to hold DAOs legally liable for things? I don't know. Um, so last two questions before we take our coffee break. I, I think one of the things that, that sounds a bit depressing is that um, we're all talking about technology that essentially enhance processes that currently exist. And I think the process themselves are broken because wh when, when you talk about reputation tokens, the first thing that comes to mind is college diplomas. 
and people will spend, I mean, it, it's crazy. You go on, on the, uh, the, the uh, minibuses and the, you, you have parents killing each other trying to get their kids in the right uh, elementary school so they can get the right reputation token to get the next reputation token. Um, and, and the other thing is that when you talked about sort of, uh, sort of value tokens in order to, to participate in the community, that's not the first thing that came to my mind is the U.S. presidential elections because you have to have a, an extremely large amount of money. So, so one thing that concerned me was that uh, we're all talking about technology, but we're not talking about th the society that we should form. And in particular with the blockchain, the one key aspect of the blockchain is the blockchain never forgets. But uh, for example, if you're in a, in a corporate negotiation, right, the first thing that, that you try to say is that th this conversation is without prejudice, therefore <laughs> we're at liberty to forget exactly or misremember exactly what happened in this conversation. If you talk to a politician or if you, I mean, the, the hard part in talking to a politician or a bureaucrat is to convince them that they can talk to you about what they really think and you're not going to go off to the Apple Daily and report that. So I'm, I'm wondering how the blockchain is going to help or is it going to make things worse? I mean, that's, it's something like all these kind of questions, I mean, we're, we're, we're at the stage where, where we're still very much experimenting and bowling and thinking about these new ideas and different ways in which we can organize. That will still be possible, you know, off record conversations, you know. So um, in some circumstances, having a value token to something might mean that it adds new benefits that wasn't possible before, and then you opt in to use that. Um, and other ways you say, well, I don't agree with the fact that this elementary school reputation token diploma is what should be valuable in society, so I'm going to try and opt out of that, so I'm going to move to something else. And um, I, you know, we would hope that we don't kind of replicate the, the same old game with these new tools, that access to capital, the pro that problem of access to capital doesn't turn into a problem of access to reputation. Um, but the hope is that with these open, um, open access systems, that can interoperate, that large swath of people who have been really cut out of our entire financial, um, social, economic um, communication networks will be able to start building something and, and then hope, hopefully provide alternatives to this one-way road to success, whether that's through school, through the right job, um, through all these other, other old kind of forms of, of reputation. And uh, I, I, I will argue that uh, what you're describing as being broken is actually not the reputation system rather than the centralization of those entities. So as we have like centralized um, university or like high schools, uh, people are fighting to actually get into this model. Whereas with the blockchain, you can actually design the centralized uh, system of like certification of peer-to-peer -peer university and things like this in which you can acquire uh, reputation because you actually can do something, because you can prove that you can do something and your peers are evaluating you and are endorsing the fact that you have these particular skills. So you can actually use the reputation system to design the centralized um, system which are just as valuable. So um, the ID persona reputation system that we're building has user configurable privacy. Um, it's based on a hierarchical deterministic address tree, so a tree of addresses, and you can have different personas that have different subtrees. And I can choose to interact from this address, which is not publicly disclosed as part of this persona, um, and I can keep track that was part of that persona, but nobody in the world knows that. Um, or I can choose to interact from a smart contract that's related to this persona and um, that interaction um, is public. So it, I, I can choose um, what I want to disclose. Okay, a question over here. Yeah, I just have a, uh, thinking about this um, decentralized uh, col um, collaborative organization. Um, I think all these models are based quite strongly on the rational choice models and of human interaction. And so um, that's a bit of a problem, I think. And um, maybe we need to add more anthropological or sociological knowledge on uh, human interaction and exchange, that there is also some exchange happening beyond tokens and reputation and all these things. So I'm 
if I'm listening to you, I mean, if I, I'm a sociologist, so if I th listen to this, I'm kind of getting a bit uh, scared. <laughs> and it may only be words, but I think it's on also the mental models that are mm. behind this. And I think uh, uh, that's something, I, you, you and you the moderator, you mentioned this quite, quite clearly. Yes. So I think we need to <laughs> think a bit deeper about, um, as somebody said on the panel, every e interaction can be, uh, can be uh, economical, and I th that's certainly not true. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. So actually, um, Koala is, is, you know, this is, uh, we've organized these series of workshops precisely because we, we need to have more than lawyers and economists and, and financial regulators discussing these issues. This is much, much deeper. And so we would love to have you join our working groups and, and contribute and, and hopefully you know, help guide us in the right direction as we, as we build out and architect these systems. I, I think that's an, an incredibly important area that we need to consider. Yeah, just, just to add, I, I, yeah, I'm also a sociologist, so that's my de degrees I got, and I, I completely agree. I mean, not, not all interactions are uh, supposed to be intermediated through a blockchain. Um, I, it's, it could be, and if people want to do that, then it's their prerogative, but it's it's definitely the case that you know we we can decide and we we, we uh, as long as we provide a spectrum for people to choose hopefully that helps and i think you, you can just see it as like uh, as with the internet um i mean i guess maybe 10 years ago people were like afraid that the internet would eliminate social interactions in fact the internet actually enabled social interactions um, so the blockchain is the same thing, like obviously we, we don't just want to become like economic tokens and, and whatnot. However, we can, we, can, we can mediate our social interaction through the blockchain and this can actually be quite powerful. Yeah, so uh, very good point, uh, I agree. Um, what we're doing is trying to put together a foundation um, upon which uh, many different perspectives on how we interact with one another can be layered. Um, we will do lots of experimenting. Some of these experiments will work. Some will be rejected. Uh, we will iteratively build better and better systems, hopefully on a, on a better foundation. The last question over here. Yeah, <coughs> a thousand questions, just one. We do have coffee break coming up. Right. <laughs> There, throughout the course of the, the uh, conference, there have been uh, uh, a number of uh, key words mentioned uh, many times, and some of them are synonymous with one another, but uh, one word that keeps hitting me is this word trust. And I hear, it seems like I hear both sides of this, uh, uh, two, two parts of this. Trust is a very, uh, a very important part of what goes on with this crypto, these cryptocurrencies and things. But on the other hand, it, trust is removed, or uh, it's taken care of in, a ho in an entirely different way, or something. H help me understand that a little bit better. It's a very good question. I, I found that um, the terminology we use here is can be sometimes be confusing. Um, the, w the way you can describe it is uh, when you walked into this conference room and you sat on the chair, like did you have to go through the process of thinking that this chair will hold your weight? I mean, it's something that just you don't think about. I mean, you, d you don't think about is can I trust this chair? It's like, and that's, that's part of the, the, the reason of thinking behind these kind of systems is that when you uh, interact with a centralized institution, you have to you have to imbue that relationship with some kind of belief that this will be okay. Um, and when you try and move to trustless systems or low trust systems, it means that you don't require that interaction to be there. If that helps. It's confusing because it's actually, by saying trustless, it means you're trusting without going through this complicated process of establishing the trust. So it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's the opposite. One, w one other way to describe it is we, we do certain things when we interact with people that implicitly show we can trust them. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if this is uh, historically true, but one of the reasons why they claim why we shake hands is to show that I'm not carrying a weapon, right? So that's implicitly just something that happens that we take for granted to show that I, you're fine, right? So that's an example.
Right, so um, there are no trust-free systems. Uh, the Bitcoin protocol, the Ethereum protocol are trust-minimized systems. Um, and in Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, we can all feel comfortable that if we see the data on the blockchain, uh, we can know that everybody agrees that that data is there. Um, on the Ethereum system, if we see a computation done on the blockchain, we can all know that everybody agrees that that computation, that state transition in a computer program um, is perceived as the same tra state transition by everybody. So that's, that's a good foundation for uh, trust-minimized systems. And uh, I will also add that uh, we need to definitely distinguish between like the trustlessness of the underlying technology, which is basically we we can like we trust the technology and we don't need to trust an entity operating the technology. But then whenever we deploy application on top of that, like I mean, if if you deploy a decentralized Uber on top of the blockchain, there's still there is still trust. The trust is I, I need to trust that the person that I'm driving with is gonna is a good driver or is is not a bad person. So even though the technology is trustless and you don't need to trust a central operator on top of it, it doesn't mean that we, as we use the blockchain in order to interact with each other, then the, the trust on the contrary, we actually need to, and that's why we need to build those decentralized governance model in order to actually understand how we can trust each other on top of a trustless platform. All right, and with that, I'd like to thank our panelists um, for this fascinating discussion. Thank and we're you so take much. A break. Thank you so much. And now we're at the coffee break from four, so we have a half an hour, four thirty, if we can reconvene just before four thirty. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, everyone, if you could please take your seats. We are moving to the last panel of today the philosophical panel if I could remind you if you have a device that beeps or buzzes uh, Alan you're on stage please turn it off no conversations and the topic here is the philosophy panel utopia versus dystopia are we heading towards a free net or Skynet I'm not actually not sure what free net or Skynet means uh, you might need to explain that. Autonomous agents, are we there yet? So, Peter Vitalik, I think we're all here. Yes. And then with that, I'm going to uh, ask everyone to be seated. Felix, thank you. And I will hand over now to Primavera. Primavera. Okay. So, um, well, we kept the best for the end. Um, so we've been speaking a lot about what is all the amazing <laughs> potential of the blockchain and uh, how we can change the world and um, uh, save everything with blockchain technology. Let's now look at the other side of the coin. So um, Skynet is um, Terminator. Uh, they have this, uh, I mean, may maybe someone else wants to describe Skynet better than me. Yeah, it's basically an autonomous uh, computer defense system that at some point cannot be controlled by humans anymore. So initially, so it cannot be attacked by the opponent and then it turns against humanity. Yes. So what happens when the blockchain goes beyond our control? This is the topic of this panel. Um, perhaps, well, okay, perhaps everybody should reintroduce themselves once again, really shortly. Okay, I'm Henning and I'm working blockchain technology at IBM. Alan Shapiro, professor, industrial design, art university in Germany. Robin Hansen, professor of economics, I do prediction markets. Uh, Peter Serra, I'm a professor at the New School and the Princeton Center for IT Policy and I also am a part of the campaign to stop killer robots. Alec Ruderin, <laughs> Chief Scientist of Ethereum. I do Ethereum. Okay, thank you. So, well, the discussion is uh, essentially driven. Perhaps we, we should start with uh, Peter um, to explain actually in terms of killer robots, um, what do you mean by that and why do you want to stop them? 
Uh, so the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots is a group of NGOs uh, that's working at the United Nations to get an international treaty to prohibit fully autonomous weapon systems like Skynet, uh, where they're really des defined as systems that can target and fire weapons independently of human control. Um, so this would be you know, all sorts of things, potentially, but uh, basically requiring human control over weapons, targeting and firing decisions um, to prevent fully autonomous things sort of falling outside of human control. Um, and also there's issues of accountability that are tied into that. So if you have these kinds of autonomous systems, the legal requirements uh, for holding people, say, responsible for a war crime depends on certain c forms of accountability that may or may not be in place in certain technologies so you could avoid accountability for genocide or war crimes or things like that through this kind of autonomous system. So, so I've been thinking a lot about like autonomous uh, uh, organizations that you've been talking about or some of these Bitcoin things and whether these could be autonomous agents and that in some sense that would uh, free people of responsibility from the actions of these entities. Um, yeah, but that's the campaign. I mean, then there's assassination markets or whatever, but. So, yes, exactly. So there is this real that uh, every discussion about the blockchain eventually ends up there, right? So um, um, perhaps for Vitalik, um, I would like to know what is the closest uh, instantiation or analogy of a killer robot in uh, Ethereum? Um, ha uh, has been developed or theoretically could be developed? Theoretically. I mean, actually, if it has been developed, <laughs> please let us know too. As far as stuff that portions of the population consider evil, we have had uh, decentralized Ponzi schemes, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's, that is a bit tame compared to killer robots. Um, as I mean, theoretically could be developed assassination markets, one that kind of that people bring up. Can, can you describe what it is? Basically, the, so the way that this works is actually kind of a, a, a kind of really cool economics on some level. Basically, the idea is that suppose that I want, to, you know, let's say I don't particularly like Robert Hansen, I want him dead. <laughs> so so what, I'm go what I am going to do is I am going to basically make up, basically have, a, have just a regular old prediction market. And I'm going to make a bet that sa that says, for example, that Robin Hanson is go is going to survive more than let's more than let's say one year, and I'm going to make 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 the bet put let's say a hundred thousand dollars behind it, and then if let's say some uh, one thing other people could do is they could just bet against me, but in general, you know, the the, the chance that you're going to, someone's going to die within one year is pretty small. But the one opportunity you do have to bet against me is if you know the outcome. And the reason why you would know the outcome is because you were the person who was going to kill Robin Hanson yourself. So what you would do is you personally would take, you know, take your sniper rifle, step one, bet 100, you know, put a counter bet $100,000 against me, step two, shoot, step three, mark your results, and step four, you, wi you sort of win and I quote lose. Well, you know, basically what I was actually doing is paying the $100,000 paying the $100, to whoever wanted to wanted to carry out that particular action. So the sort of point the so this concept was originally invented, I believe, by Jim Bell in the nineteen nineties, which was back in the early cypherpunk area. And the point is that it's this way of creating this this, this particular kind of uh, kind of service that actually Man manages to to sort of avoid at least some of the sort of centralization and trust issues involved. So, in general, you know, on online markets, you always there's always this sort of counterparty risk problem of well, how do you you know if I give the money first, are you going to uh, you, you're not going to provide the service? If you provide the service first, I might not give the money and so forth. And most of the sort of naive hitman markets we've seen on on the dark net so far tend to, as I understand, pretty much all be scams. So. With assassination markets, you actually use a sort of be betting market-based approach in order to kind of get uh, kind of get around that. Now, of course, you know there are still a bunch of issues that remain in implementing them, but it's sort of substantially closer to something really uh, with potentially very undesirable consequences that could happen. And so, um, how does a uh, assassination market actually differ uh, in terms of like basic infrastructure from a prediction market? A straightforward bond 
would be a more straightforward way. You could just say any, you know, anybody who does this, <laughs> if this happens, you know, mm -hmm. pay me the money and you, you don't have to use a prediction marker. A prediction marker would be a kind of a way to give an excuse for it where you yeah. pretend you're doing something else but you're really doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So you might, you know, you might somehow prevent the, the straightforward offer but it would be harder to present the prediction marker. But I, I, I would just say this is, these, these are general examples of the idea that if you make a unregulated system, then it, it may do things that you would have wanted to regulate. And if you no longer control the system, uh, you're going to have to accept that it will just do some things you, you might have wanted to regulate. This is an extreme example. This probably isn't what would really happen. But we, we might well have other things you, wanted, you didn't like. Mm -hmm. And so um, the um, OGU, which uh, recently got deployed on Ethereum, um, I'm sorry. It's still in alpha stage. They just finished. The I it's n it's not open. We cannot we cannot put the bet yet. Not yet. Okay. But so let's look a few months or years in the future. Uh, could we actually implement a prediction uh, an assassination uh, game on Ogo? So the one sort of key point. So the the one sort of key potential like always feel that assassination markets do still have is the fact that someone has to report on whether or not Robert Hansen is actually dead. So there, are, so there's two potential sort of l ways in which you know we could sort of avoid uh, avoid this particular ri uh, uh, risk of extreme nastiness. One of them is that potentially one thing that Robin might do is he might see, oh look, there's an assassination market. I'm going to go to the local Ido Hakkad Police Department. I'm going to say, look, there's this contract. If you help, if you help me play dead then you know we can bet against this guy. We can bet $100,000 and I'll split it with you 50-50. Robin plays dead for a bit, he wins, and as it turns out, he's not dead and he's still in $150,000. So the second problem is that whoever the judges are, theoretically, you know, they are at the end of the day going to be either people or systems in the real world that are ultimately influenceable by people. And so you could try to convince them that basically either convince them that you know this particular question is unethical and so they should perhaps deliberately either you know lie or if it's a sort of decentralized system collude to lie on this on uh, on something like this and you know with auger they act the way that the system's actually designed is that you have the ability on any question that's like binary you have the ability to vote either yes or no or this question is either uh, too ambiguous or too unethical and if everyone votes that then you know, the question doesn't doesn't resolve either way and potentially you could even set it up so that whoever created the question gets penalized. You, you could make other prediction markets on Ethereum that mm -hmm. didn't have that rule itself. Right, but then they'd still have to have some kind of decision rule and, and so it would have to either right. be based on some kind of trust or whatever, yeah. And so, yeah, what happened when I start using like a decentralized prediction market to, well, bet on things that are obviously legal. Mm -hmm. um, who, like, is, is me betting or making a prediction? Uh, should I be held liable for this? Or um, is it actually the person that is implementing the mechanism that should be vicariously liable? Or, um, like, wh where does the responsibility lies in a decentralized system? Because we cannot blame the operators anymore. It, it's worse than deciding who's liable. Even if you decide that address 342 is liable, <laughs> you just don't have anything you can do against it. Uh, <laughs> address 342 is, is an address, and it, you can ask it to send you messages or something to send it messages, but other than that, you can't do anything to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as far as, as the object level question of who actually is liable, you know, the answer basically is the user, you know, in, in this particular case, it would be myself because, you know, from a sort of, you know, from a sort of Fun functional perspective, what I have done is I have paid for an ass assassination and there are you know, very long standing laws against that. And so if you find me, you definitely can go after me. So I actually had heard of a more sophisticated version perhaps of an assassination game in which you actually design a DAO mm -hmm. that is looking at the bets that are being put on the mm -hmm. prediction market and uh, the DAO itself, as an autonomous agent, decides then to act upon it in order to earn the money because the goal of the DAO is to accumulate as much money as possible. So right. you will not hire the killer. 
the, you will just make a bet, and it is the DAO itself which will hire the killer so to get its to make money for himself. I find that computer geeks often underestimate the tendency, uh, 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 overestimate the tendency of courts to sort of interpret things extremely literally, as opposed to making the interpretation that just makes common sense. And so, a predict with high probability court will just say, "No, you hired a thing to kill a guy. You, you go to jail." So, so just just for some context, though. Um, uh, any one of you could uh, sell short the, the stock of a company and then go do something to hurt that company and get similar sort of financial benefits. And in fact, that very rarely happens. So in, in the 1980s in the US, there was a Tylenol scare where somebody was actually poisoning Tylenol capsules and they fi finally figured out, but they, they weren't actually selling the stock short. So people, 9-11, uh, people thought surely the terrorists were selling short the airline stock. They would have been able to make billions, but no, they weren't doing that. The, the best example I could find was uh, looking for in a case of this was a, um, at a finance company, I can't quite remember the name, there was a, a computer programmer, and he decided to put a logic bomb in all their pro computers to, to destroy all their data. He thought that would bring down the finance company. They had backups. <laughs> <laughs> he went to jail, and uh, so it, it actually pretty rare, um, surprisingly, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> human nature is, is better than you might have yeah, thought. Yeah, I mean, I think, <coughs> it it, it is just a sensational example for something that can very well be implemented without the blockchain. Mm -hmm. However, I think it points to something, and uh, what you uh, pointed out, it still needs the input to the system mm -hmm. that somebody still lives or has died. And this is something that uh, I, I think we don't talk enough about, this interface between the real world and the digital world. And that's where I think um, we might actually face challenges in the future when more and more facts out of the real world get fed into the virtual world automatically, and then something goes wrong there, and there's a slightly asynchronous um, situation with the facts in the real world and the, in, the, in the virtual world, where, for example, somebody uh, is supposed to have deceased, and uh, inheritance is supposed to be paid out, and it turns out he still lives. And I think that might, that might at some point create a perverse pressure that if it's very complicated to adapt what has already been committed in the virtual world to the real world, then some people will start to demand or we might even face a moral obligation in the future in the society to adapt to what the reality is in the digital world. This seems far-fetched now maybe, but I think um, if we really um, see a more virtualized and more digitized uh, economy in the future, we will have this kind of reverse feedback. I, th I think that's why robots are interesting to me in, in general, right? Because that's where the digital world can reach out into the physical world. Um, and the real world is both physical, but it's also these legal entities and other things, right? And I think that's the, the point that it's both the users and the operators and the, the software has to actually run on servers. But also, I mean, a lot of this discussion about the distributed autonomous organization, as if it can actually be a fully autonomous agent, and I think, you know, in some sense, yes, you can create some piece of software that's out there issuing commands, doing things that have effects in the world, but whether we recognize it as a legal entity, and I noticed the plantoid was a quasi-legal entity, but I like the plantoid because both it's physical and it's trying to be this sort of autonomous system, but th I think the question is, could you incorporate it in some jurisdiction? So actually who would recognize that and, and who would be the trustees? Right? Could it be its own trustee? Uh, ultimately, corporations have humans who are responsible for corporations or into it, or they other don't corporations. Have to be human owned anymore. But so I mean, but it, is it going to be corporations all the way down? Um, but it's ultimately who's you know, legally liable or who has legal it standing. Can't be if, if the stock in the corporation that owns the other corporation or founds it is, is, sh is spread out and no single person controls it. Right, but ultimately people control it, right, at some level. If they can agree? Or maybe maybe they don't have sort of voting control over it, but their their liability, right, is, is there. So they'll as lose their stocks, potentially. Hmm? Liability as a shareholder, you mean? Yeah, well that's part of it. But then also, do they have standing? So I think part of it is, if you're going to sue the, the plantoid, right, like, wh who represents, can the plantoid hire a lawyer? Can the plantoid sue somebody? 
Well, if it, for if the failing plantoid, to build another plantoid if, that they were contracted If the to plantoid build. was incorporated and it had, uh, it would pay uh, a CEO and it could also could pay lawyers and uh, it would be clear what uh, what the what the rules are, what what the plantoid wants because it's uh, part of the charter. Then all those human beings that also now let themselves be hired to do the most perverse things might also decide to work for very strange things for the plantoid. But if any of those people that it hires violate their contracts with the plantoid, can the plantoid sue them? Does it have standing in court to bring a case? Yes. <laughs> but it needs trustees, right? So the information will, was if, if the plantoid is a trust incorporated in Hong Kong, it can sue. Okay, what the legal situation would be is that it depends on how the thing I is legally structured, but it could have a, you could have a trust, and what 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 happens is that po a person A, um, the way that you create a trust is that person A uh, gives person B money uh, for the benefit of person C. But the problem is is that once you've created the trust, right, uh, A, B, and C can just walk out of the picture and have the trust continue to exist as a legal entity and the legal entity can hire lawyers the legal the lawyers can act according to the uh, the uh, parameters of the trust agreement and so, so I mean th these things already exist <laughs> right but I mean this was like wills too right but I mean they go into somebody has to step forward no. as a lawyer and say I'm no, gonna no, represent no. what happens some is that the, th entity, the, tr right? the, the, the trust uh, in the trust agreement, it says that the trust agreement is serviced and uh, operated by, uh, th this, is, this thing happens with mortgages, right? So what happens is that uh, the mortgages go into a basket, the mortgages are, are owned by a trust, and the trust hires a, a another company to service the mortgage, but they can only service the mortgage according to the parameters of the trust. And so uh, nobody owns the trust, it just exists. Right, but as soon as the somebody violates the parameters of the trust, right. somebody needs to sue them. Yeah. As or right, or but or who, yeah. who does that? Uh, wh what can happen is that whoever um, is hurt by the violation of the trust agreement can, can, go, to, uh, can go to court and but, it, but is the court going to recognize the plantoid and, and give it legal standing? If, if, the it's trust. I, if, if it's been properly created uh, as a trust, yes. And, and the other thing is that you don't necessarily have to have legal documents to create a trust. You can, there are things called c constructive trusts by which a court will recognize that a trust exists even if there were no legal documents. But can I, can I um, just without a doubt, there is even, there's a movement in America uh, for the 28th or 29th uh, Amendment to stop recognizing corporations as legal persons. And that's exactly because corporations cannot be put in prison. They usually pay off the fee, whatever it is. And uh, whenever there's an oil spill or, or whatever it is where a corporation as a whole does something pretty bad where nobody's going to go to prison for, and the incentives seem to be perverse enough and it's obvious enough, um, that becomes an, an issue again. So that you could have a corporation that has standing in court and then it's attached to uh, something like a plantoid, I think it's without question. Well, yeah, I mean, I think these corporations are non-human legal entities, right? The question is, can other non-human, can, can these software pieces become the sort of things that own and trusts or corporations? Well, the thing is, like, a software is basically just nothing but you can, like, you, you have a DAO, you, you just incorporate an actual legal entity, and then the DAO just becomes the paper but on which that legal entity But there's the U that does that incorporation, right? And I think that's part of the question is, which jurisdictions are going to allow, you know, can, so we can start a corporation here in Cyberport in three hours. It can yeah. can <laughs> Plantoid <laughs> sign the paperwork to start that corporation? Wow. <laughs> Four hours. <laughs> uh, we, I mean, yeah. it's just person A and B, but and then we walk out of the well picture. Would they do it for plantoid? Is that an early application of Ethereum? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Create a I guess the plantoid needs an agent, but that you, yeah, that should be about it. And in some way, like I think the the question is even further than that, which is, uh, does the plantoid actually needs? Let, let's not have the plantoid, but like does the um, 
Oh yeah, the plant does the plant actually needs to have a legal entity in order to be able to hire people? Because you can just have a smart contract that is just sending bitcoins to people as long as someone is actually willing to accept those bitcoins and work for the plantoid. Why do we actually need any more a legal entity for that? You don't, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things that can do things in the world without being legal entities. The question is whether we're going to grant legal privileges and rights to them. So the, the legal privilege being what? Well, the right to sue or um, get standing in court or have certain rights recognized. Because in, m in my view, actually, the, the interesting and scary thing is that regardless of the legal privilege, they also don't have legal obligations. Right? So um, if, if I hire, like if the plant hire uh, a person, Normally, you have like normal employment law that applies. In the case of the plantoid, the plantoid doesn't have any obligation to, to deal with uh, the employee in any way, right? So um, because everything, like whether it's property right, whether it's contract uh, right, because those are actually dictated by the technology, the, the law does not have any effect on them anymore, right? So it, it is not recognized. It is like a smart contract is not a contract but in it operates in the same way. So y there is no legal safeguard around it. There is no legal right and obligation beyond what is into the technology. But to the extent that we can now rely on this technology in order to de facto imitate or simulate a legal contract, then... Well, but it, it's a simulation, right? So I can enter into some contract with somebody who's pretending to be somebody else, but if I want to sue them, like, what was my recourse? I don't know who they are. Well, no, but that's the else, thing. Like, right? you, you probably cannot rely anymore on the legal... Point is that the smart contract here, like, transfers the cryptocurrency units over automatically. In which case, it's basically their responsibility to try to sue to get it back, which I think realistically will work in cases where that are sort of plainly one to oh one to one, but the interesting question is if we have sort of extremely li extremely large entities that don't that aren't sort of obviously standing in for a, a small set of particular people, then that's a different story. If, if Vital uses the Ethereum to hire a robot assassin, I will be just as dead, whether it's legal or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, well, and that's what the causal case is interesting. I mean, because you can create elaborate systems that can create causal effects in the world, and there is nobody who's legal, or res liable, or responsible, or suable, or accountable. And uh, it's a concern then if we're thinking about, so where I'm getting is, if we're thinking about regulation, like we need to think like, well boy, we don't want to empower these unaccountable systems with all kinds of rights and capabilities. Certain things are maybe intrinsic to the technology, but that doesn't mean we also have to give them legal standing and rights. In fact, I mean, that's, that's the whole question. We definitely don't want to empower them, but isn't the technology going in a direction in such that more and more the technology is taking over the actual legal framework? And most of the things that you will do usually under a legal framework, you can now do at the technological level. And at this point, what, is what matters really? Is it like the, the technological framework or the legal framework around it? But isn't, I mean, the development originally that all of the, the entire legal system, which I think we all agree is too complex and is a rent seeker in a way, has developed because it couldn't be enforced in another way and in a direct way. So it's just now being disintermediated. What do you mean, sorry? Repeat the question. Well, so first there was neither the power to enforce nor legal system. So then the legal system was invented in the history of mankind. And now we have the possibility to enforce directly without the legal system. So how is that a loss then? Well, it is a loss because the legal system is designed according to very different principles than technology. The legal system is uh, arbitrary. It, it is something that, you n that is flexible, that needs to be open to interpretation to a judge. Rules that are legal rules are not rules that can be codified into technology without actually losing all the granularity that they have. And so any attempt to actually reproduce a contract into a smart contract will lose all the 
all the human gray area that the legal th contract That's fascinating. Has. I mean, all the attributes you just described, I think technology has that, except for, and even the judgment that you have to have to supersede anything or be the actual decision, we need that. Th that is exactly what's missing in the, in the picture of the assassination contract. Somebody, uh, if you just think of it as fully automated, it's not. It's not executing as soon as somebody's dead. Somebody has to have make that judgment and put that information into the system. So I think all the attributes that you just named, like flexible, arbitrary, um, that, that's, that's all technology. Well, it is technology to the extent of the whata whatever is the self-executing part of the smart contract is not flexible. I can tell you that uh, law feels damn self-executing if you're exposed to it, especially if you don't have very deep pockets. You're completely at the mercy of people who do not really care much and might even be more subjective and caring for themselves and maybe uh, not do as exactly what the intention had been when law was created. Uh, I would rather sometimes trust the machine man. So you would rather be judged by a technological rule than by a I'm human I'm not taking judge. the judge out of the picture because we still have to have the oracle too with any kind of automated um, enforcement. Somehow the information from the real world has to be fed into the virtual world. So you don't eliminate the situation of the position of the judge, but all the, the entire machinery that's completely overpriced and just and makes it impossible for, for ordinary people oftentimes to go to court and, and sue somebody because they know they can't win because the other party just has too much money? No, absolutely. And like in most contracts, in fact, like in most standard contracts, they never get enforced because it's way too expensive. Absolutely. I think that uh, I feel that we're not ad addressing directly the question of utopian and dystopian, which was supposed to be the topic of this Abs panel. This is absolute and utopian for me, what I'm just describing. Right. <laughs> I agree, no, I agree with you, but I think that, you know, to address the question more directly uh, in the conference on blockchain, we could be talking about uh, the, tr the trustless smart contract and relying on the technology uh, instead of human agency, and I agree with that very much, uh, and I agree with what you just said, but it seems that uh, some of the other people want to like talk about the trusted smart contract, but then limit what it is, put a, put a limit on it. You don't want to think about uh, giving, giving it rights and, and giving it uh, a status in society and then talking, on the other hand, in a dystopian way, thinking about dangerous technologies like assassinations and drones and bombs that we want to make sure don't get a standing in the world. So, I mean, I would like to think through more what kind of, uh, because I'm interested in these the trusted smart contract, the the codification of agreements and consensus in technology as an alternative to the power of state and capitalism. And I, w I would like more direct uh, positive thinking about th the, the subjectivity, the rights of this uh, trustless technological entity. I thought that that was exactly what we were just discussing. I mean, actually, that, that, yeah. was, that was similar. Well, I, I don't know what you said, but I felt there were other people saying, no, we can't give, uh, we can't give a legal status. I mean, that. even without going into like the science yeah. fictional uh, part of like whether we want autonomous robots to have uh, their own um, legal entity, I think actually the discussion we're having is actually a discussion that applies today, which is, we have now this technology that allows us to create smart contracts, which allows us to codify a legal contract into a technological uh, blockchain or device. Um, and then the question, and perhaps maybe uh, everybody can express themselves is, um, so in many ways, like to answer your question, you have like in man many, many legal contracts which do not get enforced because most people do not the, the amount is not worth the, the cost of, of, of going to the enforcement. However, uh, at least my vision is that 
there is like there is an important distinction I think between a legal contract and a smart contract, which is that if you just translate the like the core clauses into technology, it's great because indeed it's more it's op optimized, it's self-executing, and then I don't need to trust that the other person is never going to breach the contract because the technology will enforce it. Where, where I think it's actually uh, where the the dystopia, if you want, emerge is when you get into like the edge cases, right? So you probably cannot, uh, uh, you it's, it's extremely complicated and costly to actually translate all the provision of, uh, like to, to get to the granularity of an actual legal contract into a smart contract. So whenever we have like a really simple transaction, yes, that's great, it's, it's gonna be self-executed and there is no problem and I don't need to worry about the, the, the legal enforcement. But when we enter into these like hedge cases in which, you know, maybe the contract says something, but obviously any judge will realize that this is actually not the way it should have been interpreted in this particular case, then you need either you need to specify all the possible hedge cases or you need human judgment. So my question then will be like, as we as we start codifying contract into a technology, uh, into blockchain or and like Internet of Things devices and whatnot. Then, um, like, is it is it actually according to each one of you? Is it actually like an utopian vision in the sense that then we we finally uh, get this self-executing system? We can trust the technology, or we, we can get this trustless technology, or is it actually a dystopian vision in in the sense that we lose the ability of uh, um, of actually infringing the law or like breaching a rule that actually should be breached in a particular situation? And knowing that in, in the physical world, the judge will actually be lenient on this because rules are meant as a, as a general guidelines, but there are always the age cases. I'd say we're actually looking at what, what people call private law, which people see both positive and negative. So any one of these contracts on the blockchain could point to a judge to adjudicate disputes. That is, it could specify cases in which uh, should be taken over by a person to judge. Uh, you don't have to have code to execute all possible decisions. So the real, real ordinary contracts, they have things they specify clearly and then they have parts that everybody understands will be adjudicated. Uh, also, and I, I think that um, this, this private law then the crea creates a new space almost of, um, of truth, so to say. But this is something that the legal system also has in the moment where for the sake of brevity of the process, um, a formal version of truth is constructed that works for law and works for interpreting the, the, the uh, situation that uh, led to the, to the uh, actual suit. And this formal, that, and that includes, for example, if you, if you miss a deadline, then that means something. It doesn't, it is, isn't, isn't really, uh, expressing anything about the real truth, but it expresses something then about the constructed formal truth that's established to make it easier to come to a decision in the process. And this kind of separate truth that exists in the legal space, and that's completely part of the, the basic tool set of how law operates, we're gonna have in the digital space then, um, in my hope, it's going to be more reflective of the actual truth but of course it will entirely depend on the interface of how you feed the information into the digital space and I'm very skeptical of about that. Still, we, we are not going to lose anything if it, if it comes to this kind of private law situation where you have a separate space, a separate truth, so, so to say, separate from the real truth, but it's just going to be the same like in the existing system now. It is worth noting that the concept of opting into private arbitration is something that has been recognized since the 1950s in 151 countries. <coughs> I would just add, I mean, to go back to the question that I would call it a utopic idea in a negative sense, right, which is, um, and to use an example, so in, this, in the debate about autonomous weapon systems, the sort of proponents, if you will, of developing autonomous weapons argue that you can take the Geneva Conventions as a list of rules and program those into the machine to assume, uh, and then the machine will observe always at all times the Geneva Conventions, and so all the people it kills will be lawfully killed, right? Um, so where's the problem in this logic? The problem is the rules that are written down in law are not the kinds of rules computers are designed to follow, right? So 
saying that you have to you know, recognize somebody who surrenders. Well, as a programmer, you have to come up with an algorithm, a code, and a, a representation, an interpretation that's functional and practical to get it to work in a computer program that is itself a whole sort of set of interpretations um, that are human, that are decisions that you make as an individual that could be contested by lawyers, by generals, by all sorts of people, yeah. and other programmers might do it differently. So how do you settle what the proper way of coding any particular legal rule is? I, I think I, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I feel kind of in disagreement with a lot of this, although I feel some resonance with what you just said. Uh, I'm, I would say I'm interested in literature and the law I'm interested in, in, in stories and the law, and especially in exceptions. It's like if I, uh, an analogy, if I want to get uh, customer service with any company now, you have these automated systems that you call, and the way those systems are designed is with rules, and, and that's bureaucratic. And it says, you know, what is the category of the question that you want to ask or the need that you have? And then it generally ends up that since the exception has not been considered as the starting point, the particular problem that I have actually can't be dealt with by pressing one, two, three, four, or five. So I think from the point of view of a non lawyer, uh, I would be bothered. You know, and and someone who's read uh, Kafka and that and that stuff is that the, the, the law coupled with power, uh, the judge, the deciding arbiter, instead of listening to my story and uh, the reality of what the situation is, has already a, a preset, codified set of rules. Uh, but law so that works kind of like that. Me law works the, like that from the start. The op right, but the opportunity of the or of the autonomous agent and the autonomous organization for me is perhaps to begin from the pers the point of view of the exception rather than the the code and and the codification of We're laws and, here about and regulations. I mean automation versus human judgment. I mean, that's a great argument to have, but it's not very much about blockchains and, and what will happen. I mean, here is about whether humans will have more, a certain kind of new freedoms of action to make new kinds of contracts that can include human judgment or not as they, as they choose, but the consequence is that these new kind of contracts will allow new kinds of actions that are harder for the rest of us to regulate. And they, and they will like that in many ways, because they want to do things that are harder for the rest of us to regulate, but the rest of us might pause and Oh no, I think also, like that. also in the positive way, there will be, on, on the private level, new markets will be s uh, springing up it's because the they can be enforced automatically, and they couldn't spring up when uh, cheating would be too easy and, and going to court always too expensive. I cannot give you a good use case right now, but I'm convinced niches will be found that will come into existence because of this automatic enforcement possibility. I think it's definitely worth emphasizing that blockchains slash smart contracts on the one hand and AI on the other hand are very different categories of technology. And you know the, the kinds of programs that people put on systems like Ethereum so far tends to be anywhere from like one to a few hundred to a few thousand lines of code. So fundamentally what blockchains are is basically sort of ways of creating highly structured and highly enforced patterns of social organization, which is in some ways very different from, wha from what AI does, which is that it actually does sort of replace aspe aspects of, uh, of human agency in, in, in particular circumstances. But actually perhaps this is exactly what is really interesting, right, is that until now we believe that in order to have something that is autonomous and self-sufficient, it had to have some form of AI. And uh, with the blockchain, we actually realize that something that is really stupid and that just is like a few lines of code that doesn't have any intelligence whatsoever can actually be autonomous. Well, uh, on the other hand, the laws of physics are also autonomous. You can think of the universe as a big, huge smart contract with you know lines of code <laughs> for carbon and nitrogen atoms, and why hasn't that led to dystopia yet? Or utopia. Because it's law-like. <laughs> 
just uh, perhaps uh, just a lot. I would I would like to like uh, so if we forget all the um, like all the illeg illegal use of uh, prediction market like market. Um, I would like to uh, w uh, if you can present like uh, what happened when we actually bring the prediction market to like the extreme and we actually decide to regulate a society according to those. Uh, would you like to present a few words about footarchy and then perhaps we can open to the public? Sure, so this will be a slight change in <laughs> emphasis, but uh, you can run organizations by doing two things. You choose outcome that you want, like so, so uh, ordinary corporation, uh, the stock is a public corporation, the stock price is a big proxy for whether you're doing a good job. Uh, there's a big dispute about whether you should fire a CEO at any time, and, and people say that uh, they don't fire CEOs often enough. <laughs> the board of directors is too shy. So one way that you could just use a prediction market to decide when to fire the CEO is you create a market that, where people trade the stock of the company conditional on the CEO leaving this quarter, and in that market, the price is an estimate of what the company's worth if the CEO leaves, and then you create another market where you're trading the stock conditional on the CEO staying this quarter, and that's an estimate of the stock value of the company if the CEO stays, and the difference in those two prices is an estimate of whether the CEO should stay. So you can imagine just acting on those market prices to decide whether to dump the CEO. So futarchy is basically this idea is you, you, an organization picks an outcome measure like the stock price, but it could be something else or it could be complicated. And then for each decision, they ask the market, would, would we be better off according to our outcome measure if we made the decision this way or that? And you just do whatever the market says. So uh, it of course has limitations if you choose an outcome measure that doesn't include everything you care about, you may things you don't care about, but it would be very effective at aggregating information to produce the outcome you said you wanted. Okay, and so as the last question to the panel, perhaps we will start with you because you seem to know a lot about this. Uh, would you actually like to live in a society which is regulated with a system such as footarchy? And uh, if yes, why? And if no, why? Yes, because I think the main thing that goes wrong in our societies is we are just confused about the out consequences of our choices. <laughs> yes, we're sometimes we disagree about the outcome measures we care about, but we, we get that wrong less than just being completely wrong about whether any particular war or regulation or something else will actually have the effects we think it does. We're, we're just really wrong a lot. I'd say, you, you know, I'd love to try just because it sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the pessimist. Um, no, and no, because, well, so one, there's this huge faith in the market, which can be smart in certain circumstances. Uh, it gathers information in ways that you don't know or understand, right? So to me, it's, it's a black box decision process, right? So and if it's successful, okay, over time or over iterations, maybe it's okay. But in, in any particular case, you don't necessarily know why it's working. And what we do know about markets is there's often bubbles of overinflated values and tulip bulbs uh, become incredibly valuable and things like that. So why are we trusting in these processes? Now maybe it's better than some other arbitrary process. Okay, fine. But maybe there's actually ways of developing knowledge uh, that has an empirical basis and, and is somehow structured and has informed by actual understanding of a situation or, or a decision. And those are always better than an arbitrary inflated market. Uh, <coughs> well, the way I would like to answer the question I is to go back to uh, what one, uh, one of the central questions of the last panel, which was the monetization of social interaction uh, and whether that is utopian or dystopian. I think that what I was thinking during that panel is that it all depends on whether we allow ourselves to think about the transformation of what money is. Uh, if money continues to be, as Karl Marx said, if money is a matrix that's the universal equivalent of all goods and services uh, quantified and is thereby diminishing the uniqueness or singularity of each object and service in the world, 
then we're going to commodify everything in sort of a bad di dystopian way. If, on the other hand, we consider how anthropology has discovered in looking at Chinese historical societies, uh, non-Western so-called so uh, uh, primitive societies, that for them, the economic sphere was not a separate sphere. It was integrated with culture, with systems of gift giving, and what anthropologists call s symbolic exchange as opposed to economic exchange. We have many, of course, money is much more than what Karl Marx said. We have many, many aspects of the virtualization of money in what uh, banks and, and Wall Streets do with money. So I, I would hope that Ethereum and this community w would consider that the monetization of social interaction in, in this platform could be something utopian if we're thinking uh, more of changing what money is and, and, and being able to conceptualize that. Uh, I think that was one of the two uh, cornerstones in addition to the trustless idea. But then I would still come back and say that the law is, is also like money. Okay, no, I think that was a great closing remark. I passed. I'm really conscious that we're over the time and we will uh, just formally close the event. But we have, for those of you who need to leave at 5.30, please do. I just want to keep those who have uh, questions. Just apparently, yeah. there is actually, after, for those that want to stay, we, uh, we added in last minute uh, a talk by Jean Bennett on IPFS. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's just take, uh, how many questions do we have? One, two. Two questions. So with your permission, we'll just take those two questions. Then one, can you do that? And then, okay. So let's go. I'll be quick. Um, UK lawyer. So um, one of well, it's just a comment. We have a couple of comments. First comment is um, when we talk about uh, a decentralized autonomous organisation, um, we think that it's some kind of abstract concept. But the reality is, the judge will look at it in accordance to the local laws wherever there's been an incident. Let's say non-performance. And one of the th key things that uh, anyone who's building on Ethereum or any decentralized system, they need to bear in mind, is in most jurisdictions, when you enter into a cooperative arrangement with someone, so let's say myself and this gentleman, we both enter into an, um, a cooperative arrangement to establish a DAO. We are in fact entering into a partnership. And uh, one of the key things of a partnership is, it's not a very good legal entity, frankly, because it has unlimited liability attributed to it in most common law jurisdictions. So if that DAO were to commit you know, some kind of liability, create a liability, we would be responsible for that liability in a common law jurisdiction. So anyone who's building a DAO needs to consider the appropriate legal vehicle for that DAO. So the best legal vehicle in, for example, the UK would be a limited liability partnership. So the DAO would have, um, would be the administrator, essentially, of this legal entity, but the partners, who are the founders of this uh, legal entity, um, who are benefiting from it, um, they would benefit from it, but not take the liability for the actions of the DAO. So that's the first comment. And the sec second comment, really quick. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, well, um, sorry. The, s the second comment was really... Um, well, any, anyway, I'll pass on and maybe I can speak with other people afterwards if they're interested about the legal side of it. Uh, I, I would like to add on this. Actually, in the first um, blockchain workshop that we did at MIT and Harvard, uh, one of the working group was on the legal personhood of DAOs. And uh, we, we have a semi 
finished report on uh, how we can actually, what kind of uh, legal tools we can use in order to get away from the, mm, the common partnership and actually design alternative like legal entities that can be used for the DAO. So actually, uh, if you or anyone else is interested in this, you can join that working group and we can try and finish that report. Okay, uh, that's fantastic. The second point I just wanted to raise was about context. So I, I feel like the discussion is um, p at polar opposites, where it's like automated world on one side and you know legal system on the other, whereas it's really somewhere in the middle. Uh, the automated system itself offers a lot of efficiency. You know, fact is, if I enter into an agreement with someone, we just write it on a scrap of paper and pass it to each other. And if there's an element of enforcement, it will depend on economic circumstance. So can I sue this person? Do I have enough money? And most people don't. <laughs> so the smart contract is helping uh, create better efficiency around the contract creation um, and enforcement, as you were saying, uh, because enforcement across borders is very difficult and very expensive. So we're leading to a better efficiency around how contracts are created. And so what we tried to do is uh, created um, an open source legal contract, which anyone can contribute towards, uh, which is selling, it's called the sale of digital currency. And our view is eventually that will be codified so that people can use this as a framework for selling digital currency. So you I think the program is great as an efficiency layer, but underneath that is some context. And it's the people that will build the frameworks around this program that will um, realize the real efficiency for, for people so they can transact better with more certainty. Thank you so much. And sorry for disturbing your train of thought. Last question for the whole conference. No, no, actually for this section. I want the last word. A quick question. You, you said that I think it, the panel mentioned there were corporations can't be held liable, criminally liable. Did I hear that correctly? People thought that they that's can't the be case. put into prison. Well, no, that's true because a corporation isn't a person, but the officers who run the corporation can be put into prison. But that very often does not happen, right? Well, it doesn't happen as often as maybe the, I would say, torch-wielding masses would like because the way you punish a corporation oftentimes is by taking money from a corporation and punishing the officers and the shareholders. And more often than not, when you know corporations are going to be criminally prosecuted, they end up going out of business. Arthur Anderson's a perfect example. That was a company that was criminally prosecuted and did go out of business. They eventually won at the US Supreme Court, but it didn't do them a hell of beans of good because they were out of business several years later. So I mean, who's, who's they? I mean, the, the employees. So when you say that people don't go to prison, corporations can have employees who go to prison. Yeah, but the likeliness that those CEOs or, or executives that made the decisions that were then leading to the demise of the company received the golden handshake. Actually, no. Punishment. If you look at WorldCom, you look at um, at Michael Milken, those you look at Ivan Boski, you look at over the last 20 years. There have been CEOs who have gone to prison and officers who've gone to prison. So what happened with GM and the 130 locks, uh, or 130 people who are dead now because General Motors knew about defective locks? And well, I don't think that's happened them. yet. I mean, to some degree, I think people need to remember that it takes a while for these matters to be litigated and prosecuted, and that while it may not happen today, it may happen in three, four, or five years from now. So. I don't want the panel to be left with the notion that corporations and their officers can't be punished. Thank you, Peter Verity. It's yep. probably also, we're also worth noting that in even because we are thinking of a DAO environment where there might not be officers to some degree, even even sort of investors into criminal and criminal entities aren't don't get absolute protection. The obvious exemption being the laws against financing terrorism. So. There definitely is precedent for even people who throw money into evil DAOs to get knocked, knocked down if, if people really want to. And, and even in the LLP or the, the limited liability corporation, the liability is limited to the investment. So all the money that the investors or partners have put in can be taken away, right? Well, and then... In most jurisdictions, you can try as a matter of public policy to limit the corporate liability the dollar value, but the criminal liability, yeah. you can't escape. And the reason governments do that is they don't want people to be cute and claim, oh, we structured a corporation, therefore we can 
engage in activities that are harming the public or people in foreign countries and, and think we get away with it. But if on the blockchain all we have is a, a public key, there's really not that much we might be able to do to punish whoever's behind that public key. So whatever the actual formal rules are, we have limited liability if we can maintain that privacy. Actually, the, the, I mean the blockchain does create a mechanism for law enforcement. It is actually quite an effective tool, and I think that's what we were trying to point out in some of the other panels is that if law enforcement just got on the train, they could probably go after people based on the records that are in the blockchain. Yeah, but that's, that's just maybe today for people who don't know how to use it. And also it's worth pointing out that that may be true with Bitcoin, but it's going to be substantially less true with things like zero cash. Like, not true at all. <coughs> okay, thank right, you. everyone. Th 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 Let's thank th you. Th 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 put it again th together for the panel. Ron, are you ready? Okay, so w we need actually consensus making it on the agenda. We had two, a fork of the agenda. We had one on the <laughs> website and one which is handed out. So I'm going to reconcile the fork with my f uh, fork <laughs> consensus rules. And Ron, <laughs> you have the floor on the distributed web for the internet uh, IPFS. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So quick show of hands. How many people know what IPFS is already? Cool, uh, substantial amount. So uh, we like to call the IPFS the distributed web because it's a, an effort to make websites and web applications operate in a distributed context. Uh, another name for IPFS is also the permanent web or the Merkel web. Uh, and IPFS is a protocol to upgrade how the web works, uh, but IPFS loves blockchains in general. Uh, it's, in a sense, inspired by the same tech that a blockchain is inspired by, which is the Merkle tree. Uh, and in a sense, IPFS is also a protocol to upgrade blockchains themselves. Uh, the structure of this talk is that I'll, I'll talk a bit about the web and why there are some problems there that we are trying to address. Uh, some of the things that have been discussed in this conference will feature there uh, to some extent. Uh, I'll describe what IPFS is and how it's structured. I'll talk about how it relates to blockchains, uh, and I'll conclude, if there's time, w which I doubt, uh, with a discussion on, how the on the project itself, uh, because I think it has a lot to say about how the internet gets patched uh, today uh, and how major developments happen in, in general. All right, so I, I like starting with this image because it is a, a very clear uh, construction of the different kinds of networks, and this, is, this comes from Paul uh, Barron, who, uh, was one of the inventor, inventors of packet switching way back. Uh, this was when uh, AT&T was switching, or, or like the telcos were switching from switch lines to packet switching way before the internet. And he characterized networks as being either centralized, decentralized, or distributed. Uh, and the major point here is that in a centralized network, uh, it's easy to think about it because there's just one thing that does all the work and a bunch of clients. Decentralized networks kind of shard that and gain some replication uh, or, or some resiliency. But it's not until you go completely distributed and peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not until you go where the protocol is the same everywhere and every single entity runs the same pieces of code, or you know, in, in their case, in hardware, uh, that you get, get this kind of fabric um, that you can break apart in any, any kind of way and the whole thing will still kind of work. Uh, and so when you think about the internet uh, and the protocols that make it up, uh, there's, of course, agreement that helps uh, understand how the, th that helped made and formulate uh, this amazing machine that we, that we have. Uh, and it's all really about specs, code, and computers, right? We have a whole bunch of ideas that we synthesize into agreements, into protocols. We turn those into code, uh, which means just taking the ideas in the specs and massaging them into a program, and then we run the programs. This means the internet is extremely malleable. It means that anybody can actually come in and change the internet. All they have to do is come up with a set of ideas that are good enough, implement it, and ship it. If it's successful, people will adopt it, and people will use it, and people will eventually make it part of the core of the internet. This is what happened to Bitcoin. This is why we're here today, uh, because somebody, one person, potentially more, but most likely one person, uh, came up with a bunch of ideas, wrote the specs for it and the code, uh, and then shipped it. And the powerful thing here is that when you think about something like the web and how difficult it would be to remake and reshape how the web actually works, uh, 
it's not actually insane at all to propose to upgrade the entire web. Uh, in fact, we're doing it already. We have lots of over between 50 and 100,000 websites already run on IPFS. So that's uh, an interesting uh, amount. Uh, all right, so the web and the internet are not the same thing, right? The internet is the wires, the web is the applications on top of those wires and those computers. And when you think about the applications that we run uh, today on the web, these applications more and more rule all of our lives. Uh, think about how much data that you generate goes into some of these web applications, not uh, you know, through companies and so on, not through the mail, but through directly web applications. Like you're using HTTP to connect to some other computer and send some data and receive some data back. Uh, we're talking about your learning, we're talking about your personal documents, your company documents, we're talking about all of the communications that you do with the mo people that most matter most to you, your personal relationships, your work relationships, your overall almost everything, right? Uh, <laughs> And, and the crazy thing is that the web has some problems uh, and some pretty critical issues that we need to address before it becomes uh, a major, major issue. And one of them is, it, recast in this image, is that the web, though it started in a distributed sense in this kind of very peer-to-peer -peer notion that everyone was going to run both an HTTP server and a client and be able to share documents with each other, it's completely centralized now. Uh, we run browsers and we consume content from web servers and we talk to the web servers through like these little um, carefully, con carefully constructed ways. Uh, but you as a web browser don't really get to publish data into the network. It, it's everything is mediated by a set of servers. Uh, which also means that if you want to download data, you have to go and bring it down from those servers and it becomes an extremely inefficient mess, right? Like if all of you right now started downloading Gangnam Style, uh, we could even suppose that there were seven or eight links in between, we would uh, end up wasting tons of bandwidth. Uh, we actually ca calculated, based on the number of views uh, when I made this slide, uh, it's about almost 500 petabytes of data coming off of Google servers, let alone times eight for all those links, You know, depending times whatever the diameter of the network is. Gets worse when you think about offline use cases, right? So if all of us were collaborating on a Google document or some sort of uh, application through the web and the internet fell apart, uh, you know, our connection to the internet fell apart, it would just cease operating. The web, web apps are not designed today to continue to operate in the offline case. They are not offline first. Uh, and at the time that I made the slide as well, there's all these other very critical pieces of humanity now that just cease to work if your latency or bandwidth are above or below certain limits. And I think this is unacceptable. I think that we as engineers need to pick up the game here and fix this major problem uh, because it actually is really critical when you think about how people are using these things. Uh, we tend to design web applications as this you know, thing that kind of is supposed to work in the best case and we hand them out to people and people fall in love with them and they use them all the time. And then we don't stop to think about what happens when the model of execution that we thought about isn't the one that applies in their daily life. We don't stop to think about when their connectivity breaks and that dependence that they developed on the software we created uh, ends up hurting them quite a bit. Uh, and uh, you know, think about like all the devices that people are getting nowadays and you know, think about Internet of Things and so on. These things aren't capable of sharing data through the web at all. They share it through usually um, native protocols that they implement. Uh, the whole idea of this amazing idealized web of documents that we were all gonna share and collaborate through and these webs of applications don't extend into mobile and don't extend into the Internet of Things yet. Uh, and so this is another problem. Like the web is getting kicked out of these devices. Uh, and the, the value that the web brought by integrating everything together is being stopped uh, from entering here. And so this is another issue that we need to fix. There's of course information silos. Uh, when you think about uh, all of the databases out there of the big social networks, it's really their data, right? Like it's, it's sort of your data, but not really. It's like you sort of have rights on it, but they control it. And certainly you can't link it to each other. You can't link it to other pieces of data on the web in such a way that will remain there should that website shut down or kick you out or whatever. Uh, so that data is... The, the whole point of the web was to create pieces of data that link to each other, and if that 
all of that is mediated through specific entities, then the utility and value of your data depends on those entities. I think the people that know this best uh, are the people of Egypt when uh, suddenly they woke up one morning to the fact that their internet had been completely shut down and their communications were gone. Uh, people had been communicating with each other through social networks and so on and suddenly nothing worked. And so this is again another problem. When you design a communications system or a communications application and you don't think about what happens when a government decides to shut down in internet access for people, that's a big problem. Of course, thankfully, people uh, deployed mesh networks and so on, and, and they were managed to get internet access back, but that's not a given. And so applications need to be built to deal with these kinds of use cases. Uh, applications need to run in local area networks. Think about, okay, so that was a man-made disaster, but what about natural disasters? What happens to the web then? What happens to all these communication infrastructures when there's earthquakes, floods, you know, Super volcanoes exploding, right? I mean, what, what do we do then? What happens if major disasters happen to data centers and suddenly we don't have our data anymore? A company will say, sorry, we lost it. What are we, we I mean, natural disaster, we didn't account for that. Um, and of course, a few companies do and actually are big enough that they do think about this sort of thing and they do replicate your data across a few data centers, but it's not, perhaps as replicated or as safe as you might believe, and it's not as safe as you may want it to be. There's also the problem of book burning, right? I mean, we have been uh, criticizing book burning as this horrible thing that happens when a society kind of goes crazy, and we think see book burning as this, the ultimate sin against humanity. We see humanity as the product of language and technology and knowledge, uh, those are the things that distinguish us. Uh, and yet, some societies burn books, and we see this as a, a trait of the things going really, really badly. Uh, and yet today, we burn books all the time. We burn books daily. We burn books every day whenever you move an, a document on the web, and, and a URL no longer points to where it used to. Whoever had a link to it and now cannot see it, uh, for them, it's a book burned. For them, they may not be able to find the document anymore. They may not be able to access it. They may not even have a search that works fully. So the critical point of the web, which was to create this idealized notion of documents linked to each other, uh, has a problem. These documents are documents on computers, and you can burn those links, and you can burn those computers too. So these are some of the critical, critical problems. I, I hope that I've inspired in you a sense of the urgency of these matters and why it is important to upgrade the web. So IPFS is this project to make the web work in the distributed case, work offline first, be more permanent, uh, be safer on the, to the user, move the content around in a smarter way, and of course be faster, because if you don't make it faster, no one's gonna use it. Uh, actually, this all started by trying to make it faster and then after a while, all of the other properties kind of fell out, which is cool. Uh, IPFS is a hypermedia transport protocol, the same thing as HTTP, and the goal is to match the interface exactly. Uh, things shouldn't have to change. Web applications should not be different at all. Um, you should still be able to run anything that you run in HTTP over IPFS with minimal to no mo modification. Some things will be harder, of course, like the more complicated web applications will be di more difficult to, to translate, but you'll gain some very interesting properties. IPFS is the product of uh, looking back uh, through the last kind of 25 years of developments since the web has been created and think about what the web would have looked like today if, we, if those ideas had been around when Tim Berners-Lee invented the web. So we, we've come up with a whole bunch of good ideas, right, since the web, invention of the web. What would it look like if those kind of made it in? And you might think, because we're at the blockchain workshop, why isn't Bitcoin there? Why isn't the blockchain sort of like part of this? Well. Uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain didn't come up with Merkle links. That was kind of an older idea. Uh, so <laughs> it would have made it, but uh, it was kind of already done. Uh, and so these protocols kind of separate out into a stack. The web is, of course, the great application platform that we know. Uh, SFS was a fantastic protocol uh, that made sure that we have a secure way to do naming. Uh, Git gives us the whole notion of version, versioning of data and Merkle links. That's where I, I, I learned about them. They're even older, but uh, I learned about them in Git. 
and of course, BitTorrent has this amazing way of moving around content very efficiently through networks, and DHDs allows us to find contents. And the whole thing is, is designed so that it works over any network. Uh, so this is not true of HTTP. Uh, HTTP, you can make it work over any transport, but in general, most web servers just don't do that. They only work over TCP. So if you wanted to run the web over Bluetooth, if you wanted to run the web over audio or something like that, you have to work really, really hard to do that, which means that nobody does it. And so the, the stack kind of breaks down uh, into these sections, something we were calling libp2p, which is a set of protocols that a whole bunch of other projects could use, and really the core part, which we're nicknaming either the Merkle DAG or the Merkle Web or IPLD. Um, and that is the core part of the protocol. The idea is to come up with one core format that makes sense for all of these distributed data structures, for all these distributed systems that want to interact through the web, through the network, uh, and address content uh, with each other and move it around. And so the, the stack here, there's a set of protocols in this stack that you can see that are IPFS specific, but the whole point is that you could swap them out. You could, you could actually use HTTP as an exchange in IPFS. You could use um, other kinds of uh, transports like WebRTC or UTP and so on. And, and you could have a, a version of IPFS working entirely over Tor and ITP, which is really critical when you think about preserving privacy and security uh, in the web for people. Uh, in a sense, this is the internet of data. Uh, IP was such a good idea because it created this thin waste around the IP protocol. We're doing the same thing, but for data itself. So we're coming up with like the, the, the thin waste of what it means to define um, these data structures that are distributed. And it's not just data, it's just data structures. Uh, it's, you, you need a way to express data structures the same way that other people express them today. And if you have ever used Git, you know that it's a Merkle tree or something like it. And uh, I won't explain fully uh, what a Merkle tree is. Uh, if you've heard about a blockchain, the whole idea is that you have some block and you have the hash pointing to the previous block and that creates this chain of links. That's all that a Merkle link really is and that's the property that we care about. But the point is that uh, Git and a whole bunch of other protocols have these different trees. Uh, there's all these different separate repositories of information uh, and even Bitcoin and blockchains are this massive Merkle tree, like this huge chain um, all along the way you have this, these Merkle links. IPFS is a Merkle forest. The whole point is to bridge together the distinct different systems by coming up with the same way of linking between them. Uh, so you can think of Bitcoin and, and Git and BitTorrent and that and so on as pieces of the same system as a whole, um, the web, basically, right? Like this is what the web is supposed to be, a way to link between these things. We're just making it so that these other really cool systems and important systems can continue to do what they do best, but still preserve linkability. Uh, and you, when you think about blockchains today, you can also think about Ethereum also uh, emerging as this other massive uh, blockchain, right? And so you can see this massive Merkle forest that we're helping to create. Uh, and again, the point is to uh, upgrade the internet and upgrade the web in such a way where um, we make the developer's life easier. Because ultimately, if you make an improvement uh, and you manage to make it, make some really complicated thing very easy for developers, uh, you've succeeded in that that's how you achieve progress on the network. Uh, if, you, if you come up with a protocol and it's really great, but like your implementation isn't helpful or friendly to developers, thanks, but try again. Uh, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna move the needle. It's gonna have to wait until somebody else uh, manages to bring that down. Uh, so I mentioned that IPFS loves blockchains and this is because a blockchain is just a, a, a Merkle linked data structure like any other, which means you can put them entirely on IPFS and use it as a transport. Uh, when you think about a blockchain, again, you have this block with some data, uh, and you know you have another block pointing to the previous one, and the key part here is that there is some link that is a hash, right? So the block on the left, when you hash that, you get the value that goes into, that is included in the block on the right. And this is a Merkle link. Uh, you get the ability to check integrity of this huge chain as it's forming uh, through that property. Of course, blockchains have this additional thing or at least in particular the Bitcoin uh, blockchain has this extra thing where, where you try to um, do this proof of work to figure out, to get a, a, a solve a puzzle around the hash being under a certain target difficulty and so on. But that's not that important for IPFS. The whole point is 
it is a transport for Merkle data structures. When you look deeper at a, at a, a blockchain, uh, it is pointing to a set of transactions, right? These, this is, these are all still Merkle links. And the transactions that aren't yet included are sort of in a pool somewhere. Uh, and the process of extending the chain is taking the transactions that are valid and putting them into blocks and extending the chain. What happens when you, when you want to include you know, data on the chain that doesn't fit? Uh, we've talked this entire conference about including things like contracts and records and important documents and so on in the blockchain, but uh, you can't actually put it in there through a transaction because you don't want every single node ever to have to, to, to store it. So you do the same thing that the blockchain does and you put a hash to it as a link, right? Uh, but these, these, this content, which by the way is, is starting to be all sorts of stuff, there's like legal records, contracts, code, emails, I've seen email over Bitcoin, uh, pretty much anything, right? What, but what happens with those links? You can't click on a link like that. Uh, there's just some hash, right? So now you have to take that hash and figure out what other system uh, it belongs to. And so, and by the way, some of these files are getting huge. Like I've seen some massive archives hash in there because you want to timestamp important details. The, the problem though is how do you make sure that all of the content remains addressable? If you were to put a link to HTTP there, then you don't get any of the integrity that you wanted because of course anybody could change the server or something and the file would be different. Um, and again, to, to review HTTP for people that, that don't recall how it works, you, you have this, the internet, you have a whole bunch of servers, uh, and if you want a specific file, you have to talk to a specific uh, server to get it back, or a specific set of servers. Um, even if a whole bunch of other computers in the network have it, it doesn't matter, you have to go to talk to a specific one. And there's, there's a reason for this. It made sense at the time, uh, but maybe not anymore. So of course, if you want to put it in the blockchain, you don't do that, you put the hash of the content. Uh, so why don't we build a system to just address everything by hash? And yes, there are some already, uh, but the point is why don't we make the web itself work this way? And this is what IPFS is about, making the web itself work with a hash-based file system. Uh, and so instead of this picture, you get a picture where any node that has the content can distribute the content to you because, again, you need no trust. Uh, it's the same thing um, as you get in, in BitTorrent, the same thing you get in Git, the same thing you get in Bitcoin blockchains and so on. But the benefit is that uh, it's a file system, right? Like we're talking about it's good to store rock records and documents and, and directories and so on. Uh, and the resolution works exactly as you would expect it to work in a file system, the same way that you would expect it to work in the web. You, have, you can have directories that point to other uh, objects and so on. This is exactly what Git did and why it became so, so successful. Uh, these are, of course, Merkle links. And uh, if people kind of think of know what Git did and why it was successful, the whole idea was that there was a previous version control system called uh, SCN and before that there was CVS and so on. And the model was that it, it was centralized, right? You had one server maintaining your versions and everyone would talk to that one server. And so to make any update, you would have to ship that, serv that update to that server. Uh, this was not very robust or resilient. If you cut any one of the links, the whole, you, you couldn't talk to it, so you couldn't work. You couldn't make any update. If the central server went down, of course, everything fell apart. Git's improvement was to make the entire thing distributed, to make it offline first. This is the same thing that Bitcoin did, in a sense. Uh, any node in this network is capable of maintaining its own record of the versions and talk to each other. Uh, so if part of the network goes down, doesn't matter. Anybody can still work, and you'll sync back when you get together. Uh, if the servers go down, doesn't matter at all. You can still work and talk to each other. This is what IPFS is doing to the entire web. Uh, we're moving the web apps and websites and documents and archives and everything that you can touch on the web to work this way. Uh, it's what I call hyperspeed because it's really fast. If you download something and you, and you have it locally and you have the hash, you never have to download it again. You beat the biggest problem, which is the speed of light. Uh, and so it allows you to, to think very differently about how to move content through the network and it, it allows you to move uh, things preemptively, uh, to have caches that are untrusted and so on. So uh, IPFS is creating this massive mesh, this authenticated mesh where any piece of data can point to any other piece of data through a Merkle link 
And the critical thing here is that you're not pointing to, a, to an HTTP server which might change. You're pointing with the cryptographic hash, which means you know exactly what piece of document you were pointing to. It's what everyone here wants out of the blockchain, or you want some of the things that people want out of the blockchain, right? As, as I've listened to people talk throughout the blockchain workshop, many people that are interested in blockchains, not from a um, you know, smart contract sense, but from a, as a way to store data, it's the same thing. It's, it, you get the same kind of properties here. Uh, and so this is, this is a, 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 a different way of, of thinking about how to store information. You can, you, the important property of the blockchain is that it's timestamps, right? And so you can think of putting data on IPFS and taking the, the root hashes from IPFS and then timestamping them into the blockchain. And vice versa, you could take the blockchain itself and put all of it on IPFS. In fact, there's people that are starting to build blockchains that are designed to be entirely on IPFS because it makes people's life easier. Like you don't have to work, do all this peer-to-peer uh, -peer stuff that is difficult. Uh, so when you think about websites today, they work kind of like this, right? There's a whole bunch of, of servers uh, that talk to each other and of course there's clients too. And everybody has a big database and the data is kind of like within the, the databases and that's it. And you talk to each other over these wires. Uh, but the problem is that all of that data is really interlinked, but those links again refer to servers. Uh, in the IPFS model, it's, a, it's about flipping that on its head and saying, let the data connect to each other um, and so on. And of course, if anybody remembers link data and the semantic web, this is the same idea, right? Like let data connect to each other. Um, the one issue though is that the link data was still dependent on those links. It's still dependent on, um, uh, on those servers. It's, it's still addressed by uh, mostly, not all link data is addressed this way, but the large majority of, of link data is addressed by um, by those locations, and so it makes it extremely difficult to work with because those links can go down, you don't want to query like 20 servers at once, and so on. What you really want is something like Git or the blockchain where you can take entire portions of data, move them to one location, even completely go offline, and still have everything in operation. Uh, and so yeah, it's, it's about deprioritizing the, the, the servers and the, and the websites and really thinking just about the data. And you know, when you think about uh, web application data, you could think about this huge graph of content and instead of making your, designing your web application as content stored in some like model in a database through SQL, you make a Merkle object where the links that you're linking between those objects and each other are Merkle links, which allows you to get all of these other properties, all of the cryptographic verification and so on. And you can sign all of this stuff as well and then get even, an extra integrity check, which is you can see who generated this stuff. This is amazingly useful if you wanna create any kind of distributed website where users are creating the content and moving it around for you. And you can do, of course, like legal records this way. You can have a contract that's Merkle linked by a signature, and then the signed contract becomes like pointers to those signatures, and like a legal agreement, or like a, you know, my legal agreements could be just pointing to a whole bunch of signed contracts, and then I could take that root and just timestamp it into the Bitcoin blockchain every once in a while and keep a record that way. Uh, and so it's this massive mesh that it's, um, it's really all about. It's about creating this, this distributed network where data can link to each other in this with Merkle links, and you can move it around pretty easily. Uh, it turns out that to be a lot of, uh, it, pretty much like the barrier to this is making new ways of like basically matching all the interfaces that people are expecting out of how you make websites and web applications, uh, but make it all work with this kind of distributed um, effort. But cool, all right, so hopefully that explains what IPFS is about. Uh, let me check time and see how we're doing. Ooh, it's super late. I'll t take a couple of minutes to tell you about the project itself uh, because I think it's important. So this, this started because I wanted to build a uh, a versioned data set package manager. So I wanted to make it easier for scientists to move around data. And simultaneously, I also wanted to make a, uh, like some sort of storage layer for some sort of like distributed agents that could talk to each other. But that was kind of like a secondary goal. Um, and as I got into, into merging Git and BitTorrent, I realized that you could actually just sync in and restructure how the, the data structures worked, make a better protocol, and use that instead. And as I started thinking more and more about it, uh, it became clear that this had vast implications for the web itself. Uh, and it's only sort of after the fact that this became clear. Um, the, 
interesting sort of crossover with blockchains is that it can serve both as a way to give links to all the blockchains out there and as a way to put the blockchains on there itself. Uh, so it makes implementations easier, but it also makes it easy to talk between blockchains, right? So if you have a link from a Bitcoin transaction to an Ethereum transaction, you can make that through IPFS and it would be way easier because the same sort of links, right? It's, it's again about creating this thin waste uh, where everyone can, can have one uh, way of formatting data. And if we follow that one thing, then everything can, can talk to each other again, right? Like let's not break the web. Um, and uh, uh, so this, this is of course all open source uh, as all important protocols should be. Uh, and it's, you know, there's a huge community now behind this. Uh, I sort of started it, but even the ideas came before me. Like um, this is kind of the product of decades of and thinking and engineering from a lot of really good people. Um, my task has been mostly integrating ideas into pr producing a good interface that matches all of the pieces. Uh, and there's, a, again, a large community on it already. There's tons of users, uh, lots, uh, hundreds of contributors, um, and also uh, quite a bit of traction already. So we, we describe our project as an alpha, uh, and yet people are using it in production all over the place. Uh, there's, like, like I said, 50 to 100,000 websites on it. There's tons of different blockchain or Bitcoin or Ethereum related companies that are using it. Uh, it recently was shipped in a very large uh, provider of like network att attached storage devices with a massive install base. So that'll be interesting when that comes online. Um, it's, it's gaining a lot of traction and moving really quickly, uh, which is great. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, kind of important to, so, to keep, to kind of like step back and, and think about how this pro project is, is moving forward. Um, and, and say a, a little bit, a couple of um, statements about how these, what, what made this successful, uh, whereas so many other projects that tried to do this in the past uh, weren't able to garner a lot of interest. I think it's critical for those people of you who might want to create different protocols and get other people to um, contribute and help push them. It is, it is critical to think through the whole thing and think about how it's going to interface with every other project out there and every single thing that people touch. And if you can generalize and generalize and generalize and like just do this over and over and over again, you'll end up with something that's very, very small and very simple uh, with all these pieces that will make it usable uh, to other people. Um, but then you'll have something that actually works and that people can get behind. Uh, so I think so many times people don't do this and it's a, a problem. Uh, and uh, I started a company to, to build this out uh, because I, I wanted to, to have like an independent group. Uh, and I think this is another another thing that's uh, important about how these protocols uh, emerged. When you think about Bitcoin, it was a person, anonymous, put it out there. When you think about Git, it was built by the kernel hackers, not a company. Uh, when you think about BitTorrent, it was built by one individual and so on. Critical pieces of the infrastructure of the network are emerging from all sorts of random places because really good ideas uh, come about. People uh, have the stomach to carry them out and build them and deploy them. But what I want to build is a, a lab where uh, it's completely open source and people can come together and work on things no matter what organization they're part of and sort of like a, like a strong arm for the IETF, a group that can take uh, the, mo the moment to look at the whole internet stack, think about what's missing, what would be really important to add, and then just do it. Uh, so that's what's, what the effort behind IPFS is becoming. It's about creating a lab like this. Uh, a, we call it the protocol lab. Um, it's kind of like Tesla uh, meeting the, uh, <laughs> the protocol stack. But uh, if you go back to the slide about specs code on computers, the, the problem that we have today is that so much research exists. And it's great. I mean, it's amazing that there is so much research and so many good ideas. But the issue that I see often is that academia is like 25 years ahead. It's light years ahead. Uh, we, it's like alien technology to us, to like us mere mortals. And the issue is that so much of what we're talking about today has been solved already by academics decades ago. And why are we not seeing those results today? And it's because this funnel is broken. It's because when we go from research to development, there's a huge gap. Uh, most academics come up with really great ideas uh, and move on to the next paper. But very few people actually take the time to implement those pieces of ideas into a system. 
And then beyond developing something, from going to development to deployment, there's a huge, again, a huge filter because very few things actually are developed well enough to be good engineering systems that people can actually use and will actually use. And beyond that, if, even after you develop something, even after you deploy it, if you don't think very carefully about how, how to launch it, if you don't think very carefully about how to get people to kindle the fire of using it, it just won't happen at all and it'll die again in the dirt. And so by the time it gets to what people use, it's been filtered so many times by these very huge <laughs> probabilities that we get almost nothing. Uh, and so I urge all of you who kind of presented and talked about problems that have you know, technical questions to read more literature because it is, it is just filled with the answers that you're seeking. It's just that it just hasn't been deployed in such a way that you can use. Uh, and so focus on that. And this is kind of like what I'm building Protocol Labs to be, a research and development and deployment outfit that can f fix this filter to some degree. So anyway, uh, this is uh, the IPFS project, how it relates to blockchains and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just stay there for a, for a, for a moment? Sure. Um, I have some tech to introduce you that might help with that gap. Um, I do want to enable some time for questions. Maybe we have one question. Okay. Someone who hasn't asked. Have you both asked? You haven't asked. Sorry. MC privilege. And my hammer. Uh, I I haven't looked. I have like only played around a little bit with IPFS. It's a very in uh, interesting project. Um, my question is, it looks very good for like static content. What about dynamic content? For instance, if I have like a Twitter, like if I go to Twitter, then Twitter generates on the fly my newsfeed. And uh, yeah, yeah. So so I, don't, so I don't know the content yeah, beforehand. Yeah, yeah, so what I mean. can't know the hash beforehand. So uh, I'll, I'll describe it in terms of Git first, and maybe that'll make sense. Uh, Git has a whole bunch of static content inside, and a branch pointer just moves to do mutability. That didn't make sense. So uh, you have this massive amount of static content, uh, but what you need to do to get mutability is that you need a pointer that can move somewhere. That is not an immutable content pointer, it's a mutable pointer. Uh, and we get that with naming. We call them names. Yeah, it's like get branches, but it's we call them names. And so in the if we go back to this, like, slide way back uh, about the links. Here we go. Uh, you see there that I have uh, slash IPFS slash a hash. That is a hash based on the content of the file. Then above it is, is a thing called slash IPNS for namespace. Uh, there is a DNS name, right? Example.com. What that means is that there is a DNS record out there that has the latest version that has a, a text record pointing to that content. Of course, that's not the best solution. You don't want to wait for DNS resolution to get updates, right? You want it to be less than a second, ideally less than milliseconds sometimes. Uh, and you get that through another layer, which I, I don't show here, but that's where SFS naming comes in. Uh, a name or a branch in, in IPFS just means the hash of a public key. So if you have a private key, that means you can create a pointer to some content in IPFS and publish a record through some system. And people can trust that name. So the name is ugly, right? It's a huge hash. It's not a nice, pretty name. But people can trust that name because it's authenticated, right? It's like the name itself is the hash of a public key. From that, they fetch the public key, and f they can verify that you signed the record correctly. Like What's that? Like an onion URL? Yeah, exactly, actually. Yeah, so SFS naming is all over the place. It's in, it's in Onion. It's in uh, Freenet, NuNet, uh, Tahoe LFS. There's just tons of things that use it. And these are, by the way, other projects that are related to IPFS and have been thinking about the same sort of, sort of ideas. So definitely check those out. Um, and yeah, if there's anything that we should do better, please come tell us, because we want to make the best thing possible. So for those of you Merkel Dags, New York Glass, you've got the next 20 years you can play around. This is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely awesome. Thank you. So put it together for Juan. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you, everyone in the room. You guys are heroes. You managed to last to the end of the day. So with that, I'm actually going to call uh, Constance and Primavera to have, uh, in many ways, the last word.
think I just want to show this beautiful picture before the end. <laughs> um, so, well, first of all, thank you. Um, again, so I guess now everybody knows, but uh, this, whole, um, this whole effort is organized by the Coalition of Automated Application, Koala. Um, which is an effort uh, that we've been doing now for one year, uh, which has recently become an official um, uh, community group at the W3C and uh, a dynamic coalition idea GF. Um, so this time we created those, uh, those new working group. I think now we have about like 10 or something like this. So um, it's growing all the time and more and more members are joining. So uh, please join us uh, formally so you can register on the website and we will uh, add you to the working group that you, that you want to join. Um, and uh, yeah, this is an ongoing effort. So we, we will definitely formalize all the work that we have been doing during the working group on Sunday and in the past um, workshop. Uh, hopefully we will have some release coming soon. Uh, the work is not done because we have the upcoming uh, conference in Sydney, which will be one week long. So there will be a lot of work going on. Um, we also have the IGF meeting in November. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I hope you, I hope you, you enjoy the work and the community and, uh, that you just continue to follow us. Thank you. Yes. Um, and thank you guys for, for being a part of it. Really, this is really started out very organically. We've been growing each time. This is the fourth this year alone. Um, we'll have five by the end of the year. And um, if you actually go to the website, there's a description of our working groups um, and some of the things. I think every single person in here has something to add to this conversation. So please, um, if you're interested, please go ahead and sign up. Um, and then we also want to thank Pindar for being such an amazing <laughs> supporter and ally and timekeeper. I'm a little scared of him. And, and for Cyberport for being such amazing hosts, um, you know, this whole time. <laughs> and of course, also to our, our supporting organizations and media partners, without which all of this wouldn't be possible and you guys wouldn't be fed. So, um, so thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I guess um, I have to try and provide some closing remarks. Is that right? So. Let me start with, I lost my glasses two days ago, which is why if I look confused and dazed, it's not because of the conversations, because I can't see. Um, but I actually actually see much clearer um, right now after Juan's talk, which closed. But I do actually want to circle back to um, the, uh, the great hack that we began the, uh, the conference, which was uh, uh, Henning's awesome uh, keynote. <laughs> So I look at things very differently now at the end of two days and my head hurts, which is a good thing. Um, so I'm really trying to, I'm not really quite sure how to close this other than to keep it really short. And I've basically seen, I think in one of your presentation, you had um, a picture of a gentleman to represent smart. Who was that gentleman? Albert Einstein, right? So I think we can agree that he was pretty smart. And, and I think he said that um, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses avoid them. So the genius that I saw in the last two days is a very thoughtful input. I mean, I guess the, the penultimate panel on sort of the philosophical one was really resonated with me. Because yes, tech's important, yes, but again, the things that are quality of our conversation and dialogue are for all the problems that we will avoid that no one will ever know about. So you'll be heroes in silent, and that will echo through time. So that's the, the word smart, okay? Second one, contract. I, I see two things, um, a, a sort of a, a social contract, a new form of social contract that, that this tech will, will, will sort of will manifest, but also a biological one, okay, in terms of this new digital Darwinism that we, we seem to be saying, we seem, seem to be evoking. 
And with that, there's the, I guess, probably the best misquote, which, which Charles Darwin said, did not say actually, was that it's not the strongest or the fittest who survive, it's the most adaptable. So how can we make the system adaptable? How can we make koala adaptable? And then the last thing I think is to f sort of begin with the end in mind and, and to really say that we're human. And I heard, I think in the last panel, the mention of anthropologists. And I don't want to get this wrong, which is why I'm bringing up my computer. Um, because we are all human. And we, in fact, I think Nicholas said at the beginning to build uh, an internet uh, of trust, or for trust. And after listening to the last day and a half, I don't think that's ambitious enough. Okay. I think we need to build an internet of love. So with that, I'll close with the following quote by my favorite anthropologist called Margaret Mead. And I think she said the following, which is, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you so much, everyone. See you at the next Blitman Workshop. Okay. So here's a bit of local culture. We need to have, in, in, in Asia, um, if there's no photograph, it didn't happen. So what I would like is everybody, everyone to come up at this historic event, the first in Asia, and my cameraman is ready. And if we could all gather on stage uh, for this historic event, and then we'll put it into the blockchain as an opera turn. <laughs> which, which, yeah. Thank <laughs> you.